Pay a buck to get a dime back. Woo! Adam Curry, John C. Dvorak. And Sunday, May 12, 2019, this is your award-winning Gitmo Nation Media Assassination, episode 1137. This is No Agenda. Dimmed by double-digit dog biscuits and broadcasting live from the frontier of Austin, Texas, capital of the Drone Star State. In the morning, everybody, I'm Adam Curry. And from Northern Silicon Valley, where I heard 12, 2019... Eh, maybe it's just me. I'm John C. Dvorak. It's Crackpot and Buzzkill in the morning. Now, what's this about 12, 20, 19? What? That's what? what it sounded like you said. What did I say? May 12th, 12, 12, 20, 20, 2019. You said it sounded like 12, 2019. I didn't say Sunday. May. You know, here's the problem. I can't even hear myself today. <laughs> what? Huh? Yeah, I've got so many, uh, so many <laughs> complaints about the feedback from my headphones to the microphone, which is because I can't wear my hearing aids with the headphones. That doesn't work at all. Um, just putting the audio directly into the hearing aids uh, delivers a, an ever so slight delay, which is too annoying because it has to go through Bluetooth and all kinds of other crap. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's slight. It, it's doable, but it's slight, and I still like the the yeah, weight. You of, like immediate, and I like the weight of like cans on my head, you know. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I do. So I either had to choose between keeping it at eleven because I have an you know I have a the output of the of the mixing system goes into a separate headphone amp just to jack it up loud enough for my deafness. Uh, but then I'd have to tape the the headphones to my head with you know masking tape. So, it could, so nothing could leak. So I just decided to turn it down. So I don't know what I said, honestly. Mm, okay. Well, yeah. Well, but uh, hopefully there'll be less feedback and that will annoy people less. I never heard it. What? <laughs> We're just going to keep this going. You never heard what? Yeah. The, the feedback? Oh, it's, it's constant. It's gotten much worse since I've really uh, been using the hearing aids a lot. And then when I take them out and I put the headphones on, it's like, what? I don't know. Wanna, what? What? can't hear it so huh. yeah but uh, just a number of people have noticed it so thank you thank you thank you uh, so we'll see how we do yeah it's true <laughs> you'll find out <laughs> well let's see we start off with uh you know i've, I've already it's mother's uh, day happy mother's day to you and your and everybody's family out there oh yeah happy mother's day all the moms that's right. Yeah, we got again a poor response for the newsletter and the Mother's Day promotion. And well, the, you know, someone said that one, you can do. one of our producers sent in a note and said it's obvious why this happens because unlike you who have no moms and think that everyone else hates their mom for some reason, um, people are sending their money to their moms as gifts instead of to the show. I saw that note and I believe <laughs> what is, that could be it. I, I think it's it's possible people are doing that. Although I don't know what could be better than a shout out on the best podcast in the universe for mom. Okay, flowers are nice too, but you know this will be around in some yeah, form long forever. after we're all gone. Flowers die. Yeah. As I'm reliably informed. So uh, okay. yeah, so happy Mother's Day. We, we do have some people who want to thank their mom, so we'll be doing that in our donation segments. Um, but you know, one of the the highlights of my television year. Uh, that I always look forward to watching is the European Song Contest, the Eurovision Song Contest, I should say. You know, it seems like every year you talk about this thing. Because I'm always excited about it. I like the songs. I like how all these countries compete. It has nothing to do with Europe. It's the Eurovision. So, you know, Israel won last year. So this year... Whoa, 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 <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Israel's not in Europe. It's the Eurovision we do this every year, too. You say so? You. It's Eurovision. It has nothing to do with the EU or Euro, Europe. Oh, okay. Just, it's, just, it's like one-hour cleaners. Guy goes exactly. In. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Doesn't says, hey, well, I went back in an hour. <clears throat> it's going to take two days. Yeah, it's just the name it's of the place. It's just one-hour cleaners. Just a name. <laughs> just a name. Exactly. Eurovision. Um, so Israel won last year. You'll remember it was kind of a funky. They, they tend to have some funky acts. And uh, and they they swept everything, and so now uh, the contest, which I think is the final, is next week. This weekend we have uh, semifinals. All oh, very exciting. Uh, but the Palestinians uh, are now calling for a boycott. Of course, 
and you fight over your hummus all the time, and now we got to fight over songs in the Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, this this will not stand. Well, the, the, the Palestinians calling uh, calling for a uh, a boycott. Boycott that that's going to close it. <laughs> I don't know if it'll close it, but there's a lot of sympathy with the uh, with the the Palestinian plight, which I discovered there is no country named Palestine. No. Yeah, yeah, and once you start looking into it. There was a good documentary I saw. I was interested in, you know, the two-state solution. You know, the two-state solution was, uh, that was the original idea uh, set forth by, I think it was still League of Nations. That was that was the resolution. This would be a two-state yeah. place. And it never played out, kind of. So here we go. Uh, then we have uh, the artists uh, well, calling for a boycott. Do you ever wonder why some, some, I mean, like PBS, for example, some you know, who believe they're you're in Europe, mm-hmm. but they never play this this whole event in the U.S. at all? Nobody cares? You know, there is one channel that carries it. It's um, and, and the thing about the Eurovision Song Contest, uh, certainly in the Netherlands, but above all in the United Kingdom, who I don't think they've won since Brotherhood of Man did Kisses for Me, which was when I was eight or nine. Um, they'd have, uh, unfortunately, he passed away, but Sir Terry Wogan, who was a famous BBC Radio 2 presenter, yeah, he would do the voiceover, and he would just sit there, probably a little bit inebriated, if not slosh drunk, and just make fun of everybody. Because the Brits always knew they'd never, ever get in the final, they'd never win. And um, and so now in the well, U.S. That would be worth watching. It, well, it was. And now in the U.S. we have, oh, what is the name of the channel that? Uh, Univision. No, it's not Univision. It's something you have to, it, I think. Telemundo. It, no, it's a, it's not the real Wong. I'm sure it's on the Pluto TV Trans- lineup. 20, <laughs> no, it's not on Pluto. No, it'll be on, it's uh, something with a T. But they get two gay guys to sit there and comment on everything, which is perfect. You know, campy, campy gay guys. Like. What uh, Cooper and uh, Anderson Cooper and uh, uh, what's his face Andy Ooh, Cohen nice and, Andy Cohen always tried to do on New Year's Eve oh, on right. CNN. Yes. Only these guys pull it off. <laughs> Court TV. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Logo. That's what it is. Logo. Logo broadcasts it. Oh, it's worthwhile. And this uh, man, Iceland has a whoa, like heavy metal kind of grunge, crazy ass with all this frightening video clip. It's not your, you know, your your syrup, syrupy. Uh, well, all you need to do is just put Katy Perry on the judges podium, and then you'll have it made. They'll, they'll <laughs> the ABC will carry it. Yeah, but see, the, now this is the beauty of the Eurovision Song Contest: is there's a each country has its own professional judges, and they vote, and they're not allowed to vote on their own country. But then you have the the uh, the text vote, and you know, and you see all the politics coming into play. You know, adjacent countries who will vote for each other. You know, if they don't like that country, then, you know, everyone hates Russia, so they don't vote for them, except for the countries that do love Russia. So it's just, it's a wonderful evening. Apparently, Logo stopped doing it. Ah. (laughs) So So much for your theory. uh, Damn it. It's ridiculous. I do think it could be, when you mentioned Terry Wogan just ragging on it, Mm -hmm. I think I'd watch that. You and I could do this, actually. We could do. Yeah, we could rag out <laughs> just as much as anybody. <laughs> but we could do a good job. I think it would be fun to have you just being like, "What is this? I don't know. <laughs> what this? what who country? Who? People? Where is this country? Where's Katy Perry? <laughs> I could see it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll see if anyone is caring. It could happen year. next year. This would be a big event. We can do a little TV. <laughs> this is our exit strategy. <laughs> you should do this show. <laughs> Hey, I'm all big. I'm all for it. Big. it. Let me see if we. Hey, how about this? Let me see if we can get a uh, a feed that everyone will be watching. A legal the, feed. A legal feed, and then yeah. and then we'll just pop on our stream and uh, and we'll just uh, provide commentary. You can sit on the couch while you do it. No, we, we got to do it on video. It yeah. has to be video. Well, we can't can't we just provide it? Oh, it's, uh, no, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it has to yeah. be synced with the video, but we don't have to be on camera. Uh, no, no, well, no, 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 no. I, I was thinking no. more like the Space Science 3000 with the two of our shadows in front. Mm. Uh, you know, our silhouettes of our heads. Mm. 
And maybe a third head. I think that's like complicating that. an already well thought out format. Just do the voiceover. You don't need to do anything okay, else. Okay, was what? How did Wogan do it? He just voiceover. He was just in the oh, background. Okay. He was okay, never, never on camera. Have the video feed. Yeah, just get a video feed, and then uh, you and I will just right. rag on it. Complicate it later. Wait a minute. A Wait a minute. Success. I think this is. Uh, I think this is it. This weekend. That's the that's the wedding weekend. And well, so we oh, have to cancel the wedding. <laughs> Either that or we can sit in my studio and do it live together. Yeah, maybe Cancel not. Cancel the wedding. Maybe not. Maybe not. All right. Well, I've, I've determined there is no news in America. Oh, I got plenty of tips. Uh, really? Uh, let me guess. Bar, bar, Mueller, Trump. What? Does it go something like that? Yeah. The news you caught? I didn't understand the word you no. you said when you. I'll did try that. it. Again. I'll try it again. Bye bye, Mueller Trump. No, 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 I only have one actually from that whole thing. Oh, okay. Even well, though I promised clips, I got nothing. I got the one that <laughs> eh, is kind of interesting. I should probably <laughs> clip this. Okay. <laughs> We're gonna clip it. We'll play that then. It's a Goldmart on the coup uh, on the Nadler committee. Oh, he calls it a coup. Yeah. Nice. And now this committee majority is on the wrong side of a very important historic time we've never had the intelligence community the fbi people at the top of the doj abusing their powers to create a case against a president where there was none where assets were actually used to try to set up members of the trump campaign when there was no case to try to create a case. We ought to be all over that. We ought to be demanding answers from the FISA judge or judges who were either A, content to have fraud committed against their courts or were complicit. Maybe it was Peter Strzok's buddy that he bragged about in his text that was going to be the FISA judge that uh, signed warrants where there was no probable cause of anything. This was an attempted coup, and history is bringing that into focus more and more clearly. Yeah, this is a very dumb idea to call this a coup. No. Because it's not the definition of a coup, in, coup involves the military, even an attempted coup. It, it, the, de- the textbook definition involves military. I don't think it does. Uh, oh, okay. Do we need to? Uh, Consult yes. the book of knowledge. Okay. Let's take a look. I can, of course, be wrong because, after all, I'm just a, a VJ. No, it's so a you could your coach could be wrong because you're deaf. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> it literally is like that a bit. Okay, let's see. Book of Knowledge. What do we have here? Coup. Sudden, violent, and illegal seizure of power from government. So it needs to be sudden, violent, There was no and military illegal. mentioned. True. But it has, to, it, has to have, it has to be violence. So there was soft no... Soft coup. Look up soft coup. Well, <laughs> that's non-violent version. Soft coup. Well, I, I think the coup is still ongoing, if you want to take it in my literal sense, with uh, the military. Bloomberg did an interview with uh, General Kelly. Uh, I have no idea why he feels he should be talking at all, but okay. And especially Kelly, the d- guy that used to be chief of staff? Yeah, Bloomberg. What's you know? he doing? Well, talking. He, yeah, what he's, kind of guys are they? What kind of people do we have running the military? This is what happens when you don't have like a major war and all the kind of lousy players move to the top so Gen- this happened in world war ii where you had all these boneheads running everything like the the head of the navy and the second nav sec and the rest of them were all let the ship after ship was being knocked out on the east coast by german u-boats and i don't know whatever it's just an accident <laughs> it was just ridiculous to watch these 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 incompetents run things until they finally got thrown out so they can get somebody so you'd win the damn thing well i thought kelly was uh, revered within the armed services, I, I could be well, mistaken. Well, be sure. I'm sure that's what he says. And uh, he was indeed chief of staff. If he's revered. He shouldn't be out yakking away about his like, about his ex- experienced boss while he's still in office. Well, worse seems, seems irresponsible. Worse, I think he's propagating a coup by talking about what needs to happen with the president's family. The team we became as a White House staff uh, 
built on what Reince Priebus, uh, my predecessor and a great guy, uh, built on what great he was guy. trying to do. And for that 18 months, we staffed the president very effectively. Was it complicated to have the president's family in the government at the time? They're they're uh, they're they're a uh, an influence that has to be Rick has to be dealt with. <laughs> and <to> the- <laughs> uh, I don't know how that sounded to you. <laughs> so I'm listening to this clip. And should play two to the head right there. Well, and he actually says he he's going to qualify that, which I thought. Oh wait a minute, are you going to backpedal on this? But no, it has to be Rick has to be dealt with. And today, if you were, I, I don't mean I by no means need uh, Mrs. Trump. First Lady's a uh, wonderful person. So that's fantastic. I thought he was going to say, "Not, I don't mean like kill them or anything." You know, no, he meant kill them. But Melania's okay. She can stay. She's good. Uh, yeah, you need a First Lady. <laughs> I thought that was uh, just I mean, that was pretty revealing. They've got to be dealt with. I mean, if, the, if Trump could trust these guys like Rance Priebus, who was the leaker, um. Mm. Uh, you need, but great guy, according to Kelly. Okay, well, yeah, they're all really should bags. not be out. As I said, there's no news and about. Although I did, I did pick up an interesting clip from a podcast. Um, this is oh yeah, this is a, so remember Sebastian Gorka? Remember that yeah, guy? He's still around. Yeah. Oh, he's he's, gotta, yeah. I, I thought he, he was a podcast. <laughs> I thought he was gone because some. I guess he got. I remember he left the administration and... and was, conflict of interest. Yeah, I, was it conflict? Was that why he left? I think there was some conflict of interest. Yeah, he was, he, it was his turn and they were raking him over the coals for being... And, he, you know, of course, obviously, he's a white supremacist, Trump supporter. Nazi quadroon, obviously. We all know this. Anyone who hangs out with Trump has got to be a Nazi. Um, so he has a podcast and he had, uh, I think it's Victoria Tunsing. Not quite sure what she does. And uh, my favorite, DeGenova. Joe DeGenova, who you know has yes. all has all this who, who great son, stuff, seems to have taken a, a <clears throat> kind of a um, a turn for the best on this show. He has, and <laughs> which is I want to say this is funny because at least six months ago I had a bunch of DeGenova stuff. A lot of it is yeah, and I didn't like hard. it, and I didn't like it at the time. I'm sure or not. No, I actually cut most of. it. I didn't use a lot of it because mm-hmm. he he's too long winded. But he's really great when it comes to coming up with crazy ideas that are never going to come to fruition about what's going to happen. Well, this is an interesting one because, it, again, it's about Papadopoulos and how they were trying to set Papadopoulos up. And as you and I both know, having traveled internationally, there's a limitation on how much uh, cash you can take into the country or bring into yeah, the country, which is $10,000. Uh, and that's, that's a... That's a and let, and, Unless you declare it, you know, that's okay, but it's a, it's a huge pain in the butt to declare it. And why do you need more than 10 grand in cash to travel anyway? Uh, but they tried to use this on Papadopoulos. Remember, this is kind of the, the dumbish guy who has the, uh, the hot Italian lawyer wife who stuck with him through all of this yeah. spy slut business. So I don't know about their relationship, but they seem they seem pretty good together. And I guess she helped him out of a potentially nasty situation. You have an incredible story, Victoria, about how this man. I wish I was Sebastian Gorka. I could just talk like this. <laughs> yeah, this John, is funny. you have He's an incredible made for, as a, pod, as yes. a pretentious podcaster. <laughs> he has the voice as I'm made for podcast made now, for I'm podcasting. Yes, um, do tell me, Sebastian. Can you ask the question? You have an incredible story, Victoria, about how this man... I do like that bottom end. He's got a Victoria. He's got it. He's got something going on. He's got some processing. You have an incredible story, Victoria, about how this man, who was targeted by our intelligence communities, uh, they try to sting, right? What, what happened to George Papadopoulos? After he was put on the Trump campaign as a foreign policy advisor, unpaid, I mean, yes. very informal, he only met the president one time at a meeting with a bunch of people. He was vacationing with his then fiance in Greece, and this guy comes and tries starts knocking at his door, basically, to say, hey, I really want to deal with you. You're now very important. And so, will you just come well, to Israel? Hold and talk on, to- I said, stop. Is this... Is, this isn't Camille Paglia, is no, it? No, no, no. It's uh, Victoria Tunzing? I don't know who she She's is. She's got the same cadence. I'm, I'm going with Milieu, who just pointed out. Okay. This is the Milieu of the lesbian libertarian. Ooh. Uh, I'm, well, let's take a look at her at her. And, but the thing that, that 
Paglia does constantly, besides having that exact same clipped speech, she says stuff like, blah, 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 you know, in the middle of things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, hold on. This is, no wonder Victoria Ann Tunsing is a lawyer and partner with her husband, Joe de Genova. <laughs> it's a husband and wife team here. I didn't know that. Huh. Let me see where she comes from. So she, Paglia, but okay. well, look at well, but she still could be a, a lesbian. Yeah, could be. If that was your your. If that's but a you, lesbian libertarian uh, milieu hmm. doesn't mean you might be in the milieu, but you don't have to be a lesbian. I don't right, believe. right, right. Okay, well, let's continue. He comes okay. and tries, starts knocking at his door, basically to say, "Hey, I really want to deal with you. You're now very important." And so, well, well no, you no, no, just no. come to Israel and talk to me about making a deal. And he's, like, "Why can't you talk now?" Well, no, I need you in Israel. Go to Israel. The guy takes him to his hotel room, and there on the bed is ten thousand dollars in cash in a suitcase. Ten thousand dollars in cash. So, I'll make it short. Papadopoulos' uh, wife loves, is very smart and says, don't. "It says don't do it. Leave it here." They left it in Greece with his lawyer. He flew back to Dulles, and the second he landed, the FBI surrounded him and started searching everything that he had and in fact they already had his baggage from the plane he couldn't believe so that they got setup. his baggage it was a complete setup of course he and didn't have were, there was no ten th- there was no ten thousand dollars but they knew that he hadn't declared it when he entered the united so states so they saw he hadn't declared it so we're going to nab him they said we got him now put the thumb screws on and, and he's going to squeal and one fbi agent said to him this is what happens when you work for donald trump <laughs> nice <laughs> nice <laughs> i believe that's true i believe that to be true that's true yeah. That's true. So that was a smart move. By the way, I'd be like ten grand, man, cheap ass. <laughs> Throw where's, the, the, where's the hookers? Yeah, hundred grand. Be Wait, hundred grand, and where's the hookers, man? Don't you know how this works? Is inflation to write some <laughs> dumb report? So that's the only kind of interesting news in the any collusion files that I've found. What I did find rather fun is I have a little flashback. Do you remember Eric Holder? Do we remember who he is, who he, who he was? You nuts. Of course we do. He's the Fast and Furious guy who was called, called up for contempt of Congress. Yes, he was held in contempt. That's correct. Eric Holder was the attorney general held in contempt. Uh, I think it took a while before they actually voted on holding him in contempt of Congress. It didn't uh, make much difference because the local uh, DA at the time who has to uh, do, if there's going to be any any real legal action, he was a... Oh, oh, staunch uh, Obama supporter, and he wasn't going to go anywhere with it. Yeah, there was a couple other things besides the gun running, which was known as Fast and Furious. There was uh, arresting journalists, <laughs> spying on journalists. I, I, we have such short memories. And, uh, the M5M, even shorter, doesn't seem to recall that. Uh, but yeah. I do have a couple of sound bites, a little compilage, if you will, of the mainstream back when we were talking about contempt <laughs> of Congress of an attorney general, except this was the Obama Attorney General. Given what we know about the Republican Party and the way the House of Representatives conducts itself when run by Republicans and with a Democrat in the White House, it shouldn't really count as news when a House committee finds the Democratic Attorney General in contempt of Congress. Every single Republican voted to hold the Attorney General in contempt over this crazy conspiracy theory. Tell the Republicans to stop this witch hunt now. He's right. Why go ahead with a contempt vote? Look, there are certain internal documents that are not Congress Congress's business. But why? It just looks like more of our broken politics and vicious fights now out in the open. A party in the Congress that does just about nothing to create jobs or to help people without jobs decided the best way to do their job is to shower the Obama administration with subpoenas. See, if you are a person who watches Fox News all day, it is possible that you have been marinating in this conspiracy theory for long enough now that this seems feasible. <laughs> well, is this sort of stop and frisk at the highest level? Go at the attorney general, get in the empty pockets. It looks like stop and frisk, doesn't it? Let me finish with my personal views of the stop and frisk thing. And I don't mean to use this term too much, but it's almost like a stop and frisk. For a lot of people, this is Republican versus Democrat, and they say this is just theater. It amounts to nothing. It is a distraction. It is politics writ large in in Washington, according to most people. This is really much more to be filed in the category of politics than law. This is contempt kabuki. Uh, This is a classic case in Washington of where you stand is a matter of where you sit. When the Republicans have the White House, they love executive privilege. I like contempt kabuki. I like, yeah, I like contempt kabuki too. There was something else in there I liked. It was, 
Well, unfortunately. Now, of course, my point, obviously, is uh, people, this is the same shit, just different team. It's wrestling. Yeah, WWE. Yeah, without the without the cool suits. Yeah, and the guy with the, with the guys, you got the Gomert instead of a <laughs> guy talking like this. Yeah, Gomert. <laughs> Beto could be one of the Mexican terror twins. Oh, wait, that's, yeah. I'm, I'm confusing them. I'm sure. I don't know much about wrestling. Yeah. It's exactly the same. Exactly the same stuff. Now it's just the other parties yelling the same. Fox News is now saying what these guys were saying. Although Fox News, man, something's something's very odd with them. They yeah, are going well. They're going off message. Style. They're going off message. They're going to lose their audience doing this. By the way, I, the whole reason I think for so being too. is to present a concise. It's like watching Shields and Brooks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Shields and Brooks, they're supposed to be, you know, supposed to give us two sides of an argument. No, no, they're both in total agreement. And, I, and who wants to watch them? I mean, I do have a in fact. I got a good example. This is a summary of the latest Shields, Brooks and Shields summary it's on PBS. On Chipotle. top of subpoenas for the president's son, subpoenas for the attorney general. Uh, what do we make of all of this? Well, I mean, I think it's the House Banking Committee uh, uh, across the board uh, and, and now uh, led by uh, uh, that. Have, uh, I, I just think, Judy, that uh, uh, in, the, in the Iran, uh, in, in Venezuela, uh, um, I mean, it, it's just but this and, and for the and for the this isn't the system wasn't intended for this i mean you know it's the complete breakdown of the checks and balances system i smell dvorak's razor blade in this uh, this cliff no, that's the way it goes no he talks like that no yeah no, much. i don't believe it i have a different example of fox news just go, i don't know this is specifically tucker carlson and i think he may <coughs> i don't know he's compromised but not not in the way you would think he had andrew yang on now Andrew Yang is is we're focusing on him because we get complaints that we don't that no one focuses on him. Um, we he's love. He's got no money. I mean, I'm surprised he gets as much airtime as he does for a guy with no money. Well, it, I, for, we love his PowerPoint idea, the State of the Union on PowerPoint, and that's that's his, like that's his, his slogan for this year: PowerPoint, PowerPoint. Um, he is the man who on Joe Rogan was talking about the universal basic income being the way to go. And now he has a new gambit, which he rolled out on Tucker Carlson. I was, well, it wasn't surprising to hear this from um, a Democratic primary candidate. It was surprising to hear Tucker Carlson all in on these, this idea. I have standing in this particular area, uh, having lived in multiple countries with this particular situation. And I thought it was interesting that Fox, again, is moving away from their, their core message. I don't know if a lot of people in America understand what, what this is really about or what it really means, but the way it's presented is, I'm curious at best. Yeah, and Amazon's the most egregious example, where they're now soaking up $20 billion in business and causing 30% of American malls and stores to close, and taxpayers are seeing zero in return. So if you look at what other advanced economies have done, they've figured this out. They've said, look, we need to have a mechanism in place so that Amazon's going to pay its fair share along with Netflix and Delta and these other companies that are paying zero in taxes. So what they've done is they... Oh, can you guess? Can you guess? Uh, government regulate the, no, the no, Amazon? No, 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 no. It's better. Well, in a way, yeah. Actually, yes, in a way. They've adopted a value-added tax <laughs> where then... The American oh, no. people would get oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Stay with it. Tiny slice of every Amazon sale, every Google search, and on and on. And it's very, very hard for companies like Amazon to game their way out of. We're well, actually going to roll that back for a second because he, he literally says here. Yeah, let's see. And Delta and these other companies that are paying zero in taxes. So what they've done is they've adopted a value added tax where then the American people would get a tiny slice of every Amazon sale, every. No. This is the. Uh, what a, what a this is a lie. Idea. This is a scam. This is well. I'm going to play the whole clip, but the value added tax. He's saying, "Oh, the American people will get a piece of that." Yeah, after you pay all of it. So here's his brilliant idea. Let me see. I'm going to pay this value added tax, and I'll get 10 percent of it back in services. That sounds like a great deal. Uh, yeah, no, you pay a buck to get a dime back. <laughs> Google search and on and on. And it's very, very hard for companies like Amazon to game their way out of uh, a value added tax system. So, so why don't we have that? 
Oh, it's a great question. Because I mean, we're not people stupid. Have... <laughs> Just listen to it for a second. <laughs> we could stop it every 10 seconds. Companies like Amazon to game their way out of uh, a value added tax system. So, so why don't we have that? Oh, it's a great question. I mean, uh, people have been no, uh, advocating for it <laughs> for quite some time, question. and my campaign <laughs> is advocating and championing it right now because we, we need to wise up to the fact that companies like Amazon are very smart and moving their earnings uh, through places like Ireland, where the American taxpayer will see none of it, whereas a value-added tax will make it impossible for them to sell to us without paying into uh, our society their fair share. As if they're going to be paying that fair share. This is so great the way he's explaining it. And Tucker buys it. So why are you the only candidate who's thinking through what to do about this? <laughs> yeah, well, we already answered that question. It gets kind of weird. Um, I think it's weird. Again, all you have to do is look around the world and say other countries, other advanced economies have figured this out. We're the only advanced economy that does not have a value added tax in place. Uh, and we need to make sure what? that the American people are actually seeing some of the gains from the incredible innovation and, and value that companies like Amazon and, and uh, Salesforce and Netflix, all of whom paid zero in taxes last year, uh, are getting away with, really. And they're doing their job, which is to pay as little in taxes as possible. We have to do our job, which is to make it so the American people see our fair share. So does that, I mean, just to argue the other side for a second, d would that increase... I mean, presumably it would increase the cost to American consumers of goods, right? Yes. Well, in some instances, uh, in some cases, uh, the companies will find cost efficiencies or eat part of it. Um, uh -huh. And that's one reason why my uh, campaign wants to take that money that we're getting from the value-added tax and return it to the American people in the form of a dividend, uh, because that's the most direct way that we can actually have the American people benefit. Uh, the fear is that even if we do end up increasing the tax rate on some of these companies and American comes. people won't benefit from that. Andrew Yang, certainly the most interesting person running for president. And I well, sounds like no. a great idea to me. I appreciate it. Thanks it's a great much. idea. There you go. Great you idea. Did. Let's enlighten uh, Mr. Carlson about uh, the value added tax, which I lived under in the Netherlands and Belgium and uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, the ta the value added tax in the Netherlands when I was there, I think it's still it's either twenty or twenty one percent, and you yeah, pay you for pay that. that much off the top on uh, yes. everything you buy, and it's an added tax, so it's not built yeah, in. Yeah, get the word added in there. That's yeah. what the thing that Tucker sort of said. Well, it's in other words, more taxes. Yes, and and you consumer, you pay for it. And here's the problem with the value added tax: if you add that, if you start down that road. It'll be, okay, everybody, great idea, 5% value-added tax, and uh, somehow, just like the carbon tax in Scandinavia, it'll come back to you magically. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're paying that. And you know what happens in uh, two years? Hey, everybody, we've got a, we we get more a money. little shortfall here. We need to up that value-added tax just a bit. Don't worry. It's really the company's paying for it. Don't you worry about it. It's all good. Bad yeah, idea. That's ten percent. That is fifteen. I'm amazed. Funny. I'm amazed how how he can back this. There's clearly a right wing alt right well, it's Nazi quadruple. To me, that Tucker doesn't travel that much. <laughs> he probably doesn't. I don't, now, now that I think about it, I don't know that he's ever talked about any other country. He's well, ever he <clears> may, may go down to Cancun, and that's about it. Listen, we we grew up watching this guy, and he was wearing a bow tie. So, you know, right. you don't travel anywhere if you wear one of those. No, not unless, you unless you're a shit. professor and, you, you know, a visiting scholar somewhere. I'm a publisher. <laughs> I'm a publisher, <laughs> yes. I put him up the same level as my, uh, you know, as uh, Christopher Buckley, my ex-cousin-in-law, uh, whatever he was. Mm -hmm. That kind of guy. Yeah, he would. Oh, that internet, Adam. Pfft. Who was going to want to read the newspaper on the on a computer screen? Yes, no one. <laughs> I, I okay. I have an AOL address, but that's all I'm doing. I'm just keeping it to that. Christopher Buckley, douche. So that is the media landscape. It's changing rapidly. Where we have a guy like Yang promoting this, and it's hey, this sounds like a great idea. That sounds, it's, it's again, it's like soccer. Now, I do want to point out, I've had down in my notes, I want to make a prediction. Do you still have a red book? We haven't looked in the red book in a long time. I gave up on it because I realized I can't read my own writing. I think that uh, football. But people keep track of these so you can predict what you want. Okay. 
I believe that uh, football, let's just call it instead of soccer, football, I think is going to be extremely big on U.S. television, but it will only will be women's football. There's something about this that, especially our team, the United States team, who are all cute, there's something about this that is going places. That's my prediction. I think we'll we see this. enjoy women's. When I was in Croatia a few years back, uh, we were talking about this, and the Croatians said, well, you, uh, we understand that football is very popular in the United States, but only amongst women. Hmm. And women, there's only women teams. Men don't play it. Isn't isn't our our? And I said our, they, when they said that, I might could have corrected them. I said no, you're absolutely right. Men do not play soccer, as we call it. Yeah. It's only played by women, and uh, that's to, just the way it is in our country. It's it's for women only. Now, is it, we we have a really good team, though, don't we? Yeah, all, world champs. Yeah, yeah, we have great women soccer players. Well, I I want to promote them. I, I think we I'm, should. I'm looking at the list of, by the way, just to back up a little bit. Look at the list of value added tax, and remembering it, it starts always starts off like at five or ten percent. Mm-hmm. Right now in Hungary, it's twenty seven percent. Jeez, I thought they harmonized that the EU. Everyone had to have twenty. No, no, they're all different. Really, Norway hmm. is twenty five percent. Twenty five percent. Twenty five percent. I remember uh, back when I had money in an airplane. It's like, yeah, I want new avionics. They said, okay, well, it's going to be. I was like. 8,000 euros or something. Like, wow, that's a lot of money, but okay. Whoa, 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 but there's 21% value added tax. Like, what? <laughs> it just threw on 2,000, 2,000 euros just for, uh, no. It, may, it drives you nuts. I'm looking at these other numbers. 25% for the Far, Fargo Islands. This is everybody's, this is crazy. Mexico's I'd like to have our no it. agenda logo on the, uh, on the, the team uniform. That'd be cool. We can make it happen. I mean, this. When you're traveling, people should know this. When you're traveling, if you get your receipts for everything you buy, that's over a few bucks. Yeah, you can you get can your. Take it to the airport. Yep. Your value added tax back. Stand in line and get your money back. Yeah. Yes. Which is not always convenient. No, it's not always convenient. And the people who are sitting there are also, they're mean. Especially with the people in France. I think I, I bought a pair of glasses in France because I broke my glasses, got a new pair, and I wanted, went to retrieve the VAT. And they just, they're just mean and rude. But you, you went in to, France? That's yeah, a shocker. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, who would have thunk it? It's crazy. Okay, so now Yang is off, off my list of anyone even worthwhile. I, well, to su- any, mm-hmm. Anytime anyone brings up the value-added tax, and, and especially when they throw the bull crap at you like he did, which is Just all line. advanced economies yeah. use the value-added tax. <laughs> yeah, the smart ones have it. Yeah. Yeah, because the... Uh, Mind you, that, you know, that VAT also gets tacked on to medical costs, medical procedures. Oh, yeah. It's, it's added. It's yes, value. It's added. And yeah. where's the value? Yeah. I like this value, value. added yeah. tax. Yeah. It really should be just called an added tax. Yes. The dummy so tax. He, so here's a uh, uh, thing I picked up of one of the networks, uh, just a... A kind of a rundown. You know, they really do want Biden to run. They think he can win. Yeah. Uh, and so here's a classic rundown, a Biden rundown of what's going on with Biden. And who's this from? Which outlet? It's You know, I forgot to write it down, but there goes the Zephyr. It's <laughs> one of the, oh, an extra car today. Oh. Uh, the... Uh, one of the networks. From the minute Joe Biden sets foot onto the campaign trail, he is the person to beat. The question is whether one of these 19 other candidates emerges as his chief adversary or whether his biggest obstacle will be Joe Biden himself. The Taoiseach knows a lot about it. His mom uh, lived in uh, in Long Island for 10 years or so. Uh, God rest her soul. And uh, um, although she's... Wait, your mom's still... Your mom's still alive. Your dad passed. God bless her soul. He is now the front runner because he is a household name. They put one foot in front of the other. They keep going. 
That's the unbreakable spirit of the people of America. And also he brings a much broader set of policy experiences to the table than really any other candidate. I believe we have so botched this policy, so botched the opportunities to move on the Sandinista government. The SNL scandal, we need not tell anyone, is the biggest white collar rip off uh, in this nation's history. Judge, if I look only at what you've said and written as used to happen in the past, I would have to vote no. For all the respect that he is given as the elder statesman, if you look back at Joe Biden's previous races, his 1988 bid flamed out in the middle of a plagiarism scandal. In 2008, he won exactly 4% of the vote in the Iowa caucuses. There is a lack of message discipline. The next vice president of the United States of America, Joe Biden. I remember in the 2008 campaign after the Obama team put him on the ticket at a fundraiser late in the campaign, he went so far as to apocalyptically almost predict there would be a major international crisis. This was one of those moments tailor-made for a Saturday Night Live parody. Mark my words! If you take away nothing else from what I say here today, or indeed in this entire campaign, remember this. If Barack Obama is elected, we will have a crisis. (laughs) Yeah, I'll give Joe Biden credit for one thing. He dragged Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama uh, into a same-sex marriage. Do you remember that? No. Yes, it was. Obama was going to come out and announce the policy on maybe a Monday or Tuesday, and then on some some interview. But it was a, it was a problem because you know he was basically the guy that uh, on an interview I mean, it was with Robin, I think, from Good Morning America. Robin, is that who it was? And he said, "Oh no, I think uh, same-sex marriage should uh, should be okay." And he just went all in on it, which we had, and this was shocking at the time. No one had heard of what? Are you? This is from the White House. And then, uh, and Obama and and Hillary, they immediately had to kind of jump on and say, "Oh yes, 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 we've changed our views on this." And that was Joe Biden who dragged them into that by basically jumping into the announcement, which he wasn't even supposed to do in the first place. Yeah, he does a lot of that. Yeah. I consider that bumbling. Well, he plays it off as bumbling. I think he's a lot smarter than we might give him credit for in that regard. Well, that's a possibility. But Gates, the guy who was used to be in the uh, CIA and whatever, and he was in the various staffs of the Obama administration, <coughs> who wrote this book, if you recall, pretty much about the Obama administration, said everything Biden did was just a, everything he did was wrong. Hmm. Well, the only reason why he's being pegged up on top right now is because he's got the money. You know, when you raise seven hundred thousand dollars in one yes. night, then the news media is like, "Hey, Joe, <laughs> hey, how you doing? Let's do another interview so you can buy some ads." It's their money. They see that as their money. Yeah, who's who's well, got the is. money? Biden's right. It's our money. Let's go get that money. And then they go and you know Monday. No, wait, Monday. Uh, yes, Monday night. Watch what happens with... Man, are you okay? I'm having a lozenge. Okay. Uh, Umberto is uh, going to reintroduce himself. I'm reading from the Associated Press. O'Rourke plans to step up his national media appearances after skipping most of that kind of exposure in recent months. He is scheduled to appear on MSNBC's Rachel Maddow show on Monday night and ABC's The View the next day. O'Rourke acknowledges he struggled to find his presidential campaign footing. Sounds like he struggled to find a good booker. I think in part I was just trying to keep up when I first started out, he said, after addressing about 40 people at a recent house party in Newton, Iowa. I really feel like I found my rhythm and my pace. I just feel comfortable. I feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. It's my calling. I sh- this is where I belong. I'm Beto. So we'll see. Well, and he's he, lost so much momentum, and when you hear him, uh, yeah, like he's, he's dumb. He's just dumb. Well, he also has the. He tries to sound like Obama with that pacing. Yeah, and he's waving it his arms. It sounds like he's doing an Obama. 
But, you know, all you hear him say is we've got to do, you know, comprehensive this, reform that. Impeach the president. At least, at least Yang, at least Yang is saying, oh, we're going to do a value added tax. Oh, we're going to do universal basic income. He's not saying, oh, we should, no, he's, he's, at least he's saying something. Elizabeth Warren's still the favorite amongst the graduating class. We just got one back here. Um, done with the, with four years in Arkansas. Liking what Elizabeth Warren has to say feels somewhat cheated, scammed by the system. And everyone's talking about Liz. Hey, you know what? We don't care about anything. Just take this debt off of my books. She's yeah, got a real good. shot with that. She's the got a real she, shot. She's got that. And if, the problem is she's got something. She's got stuff like this too. She has too much. She's creating problems for herself. With, with I play my Warren clip. Hughes op-ed comes just weeks after Massachusetts Senator and 2020 hopeful Elizabeth Warren unveiled a plan to break up tech giants, including Facebook, Google, and Amazon. Oh yeah, she has no focus. This is she's an idiot. She has no focus. She had. She has something going with these kids who are all of voting age. They probably won't vote. You know, these were the the Beto voters who didn't really come out in Texas. Yeah, for sure. Too much work. Yeah, but it, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. I'm finishing if, my game here. But if you got thirty or forty thousand dollars in in uh, in student loan debt. I think I can go to the poll and vote for you, yeah, Liz. Yeah, maybe, but I got Facebook. No, no, I disagree. These kids are also moving away from Facebook. They're moving away from social media. Now they had, you know, they they actually have to do. They're getting dogs. My dog won't let me go. <laughs> well, the idea of breaking up the tech giants, besides being scatterbrained, is like, wait a minute. These are the guys who got all the money. And you're yeah. gonna, you know, so you're gonna turn on, you're gonna bust up Amazon. Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. Hello, hello, knock knock. You, uh, well, I'm so. against, I'm against all of this. I'm against all of these the, the breakup ideas because I see the internet as a network that anyone can access and anyone can use whatever you know uh, freely available protocols there are to distribute your information. Now, I don't think necessarily Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram are the internet. You know, that's what people believe, but it's not true. It's not. It's, not, it's just not true. It's not so, true. So let, let these guys wallow in their own shit. That's fine. I don't need to use them. You know, but anyone who participates in this, uh, in this breakup conversation is giving them too, too much credence and doesn't know what the internet is. It's like you know, you're looking at the America Online version of the internet. That's what you're talking, Elizabeth Warren and all these other people. Yeah. They don't even know how to turn on a computer. Well, I think, I'm pretty sure they could do that. You, oh, you give them I'm some credit. Right. I don't know. Mm. Hey, Bill, can you turn on my computer? I don't know how to do it. I'm pretty sure that's what's going on. <laughs> it's that round button. <laughs> There's a lot of different things that are problematic for, uh, for people in government. They, for instance, have you been tracking Bitcoin? Uh, no, I don't follow Bitcoin that closely. Well, going back to, I think, November, yeah, November last year, <clears throat> the prices dropped from around $6,300 to down to a low of just above 3000 Right. And now, that if you, much I know. And if you look today, uh, I can look right now, but last I checked, it was over 7000 And if you've ever looked at a at a stock chart, it looks like the longest... Bear trap, bear trap I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, and no, that's actually down a bit now. So it's sixty eight, but it was up to uh, no, it's up as high as like, almost seventy four hundred, um, which is you know higher than it was when the drop happened. And this is causing concern for a lot of people, uh, certainly in in government. This is uh, Congressman Sherman. And he has, a, he has only one way to go for this. I look for colleagues to join with me in introducing a bill to uh, outlaw cryptocurrency uh, uh, owner, uh, purchases by Americans so that we nip this in the bud, in part because... <laughs> I love to nip it in the bud. Hello, 10 years, <laughs> ten, 10 years, ten years Hey, there's something to this Bitcoin <laughs> shit. We should nip that in the bud. Let me, let me write up a bill for y'all. Bud. In part because not uh, an awful lot of our international power comes from the fact that the dollar is the standard unit, 
of international uh, finance and transactions. Clearing through the New York Fed is critical for major oil, oil and other... I'm just going to interrupt him, then I'll play that bit again. He, what he's saying is is true, although it may sound very, very uh, unbelievable to most. When you transact money, I think even if you go from, let's say, um, the Netherlands to Germany, I believe it's still eventually goes through the SWIFT clearing system, or they may be using the full, the full European system, but the SWIFT, American banking system, has fought very long and hard to make sure all <laughs> money transactions go through our system, through the Fed yeah. system, all of them. Certainly when we're talking about dollar purchases, um, but, the, you know, and he, this guy's really just laying it out as to why this is a problem because of, you know, what interests we have and I think it greatly Sounds explains like a problem to me. <laughs> to me, it sounds like this is exactly why Bitcoin needs to exist. Of international uh, finance and transactions, clearing through the New York Fed is critical for major oil, oil and other transactions. And it is the announced purpose of the supporters of cryptocurrency to take that power away from us, to put us in a position where the most significant sanctions we have on Iran, for example, would become uh, irrelevant. So whether it is to disempower our foreign policy, our tax collection uh, enforcement, or our law, traditional law enforcement, the purposes of cryptocurrency, the advantage it has over uh, uh, sovereign currency is solely uh, to aid in the disempowerment of, uh, of uh, the United States and the rule of law. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I Bitcoin, think he's right. Bitcoin is anti-American. Yeah. It's true. true. I'm, all, I'm all for it, I have to say. I'm all for it. I think it's great. We, should, we deserve a little competition on our dollar. Yeah, we're going to get it from the Chinese. Yeah, yeah, we certainly are. Well, the, how are the Chinese? Now, do you guys, I mean, you can track that over DH Unplugged. They got their, their increased uh, tax tariff. Or uh, the import It's tariff. impossible to really track them because they lie. The Chinese? Yeah. Well, what are they lying about? They lie about their numbers. You don't know what the hell's going on with them. Uh -huh. Someone sent me this, uh, you know, for all you can say about him, Trump has been extremely consistent throughout the years prior to his presidency with the same talking points going back to Oprah show in the late 80s, early 90s. And here he is addressing... A crowd in 2011. Had, did he, was he running in, in somewhere around that time? He was just making noise about Obama, wasn't he? 2011? About uh, birth certificate? Well, he was running in the year 2000. Right, but not 2011. He was just making, well, making noise. He was just, he's always, he's always running. He's always promoting his show and running. <laughs> yes. So here he is addressing a crowd specifically about taxing China and how to tax China and how to present it. I see what China's doing. I'll give you a little China story also. China, I said the other day, very, very hard to buy anything outside of China, or oh, certain other countries also, but China's, you know, the one. And I said, so we said, well, what would you do? What can you do? So easy. I drop a 25% tax on China. And, and, you know, I said to somebody that is really the messenger. The messenger is important. I could have... One man say, we're going to tax you 25%. And I can say another, listen, you motherfuckers, we're going to tax you 25%. <laughs> hmm. I guess he what? chose for the second way of doing it. <laughs> Jeez. They're responding poorly, I understand. The Chinese? Yeah. They don't like it. Yeah, they don't like to be intimidated. But you know what I'm, what I'm reading everywhere? Is, oh, okay, fine. You know, you order this stuff and it gets shipped from Vietnam. They're just, they're just uh, kind of using Vietnam as a P.O. box now. Well, I haven't heard this. Where did yes. you get this? Oh, I've, I've read it everywhere. Have you gotten anything from Vietnam? I have also received, this is what tipped me off to it. Uh, I used to buy art from both China and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Um. And uh, different shops that did uh, uh, all kinds of custom. And uh, it was just some fabulous uh, artists in those areas, especially Vietnam. They got a lot of, it's very artsy. If you go to visit the country, you go, holy mackerel. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I noticed the one thing I noticed the most was that <clears throat> FedEx and whoever else it was had some deal. So it was pretty much everything coming out of China was free shipping mm -hmm. or it was a dollar. Mm -hmm. And I was always befuddled by this because it, 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 the same products out of Vietnam would cost like $30 in shipping minimum. And uh, it was it just seemed to me that what, how does China doing this deal with FedEx or whoever it was, UPS, all of them, they're all giving China this huge deal or the Chinese were eating the price. I don't know what was going on, but I thought it was, there was some moment of corruption. Well, we ordered, sort. Uh, when we moved in, we ordered a chair from West Elm, the company West Elm. And we've ordered from them before. And as with pretty much all furniture, uh, it comes from China. Uh, but this time, because we've ordered from them in the past, this time it showed up, huge box, large print, made in Vietnam. Don't think it's China, it's made in Vietnam. Now, it doesn't say made in China on the chair itself, but I'm I'm pretty, con and then I started looking into it, and I'm seeing um, they're either doing subsidiary deals with factories, but basically using Vietnam as a P.O. box. No, I don't think so. I think it was made in Vietnam. Okay. Could be. I'm just saying we used to get, from the same company, it will be shipped from it's China. Just, uh, the Chinese have been notorious for like uh, moving their manu. It's funny. The Taiwanese moved their manufacturing to China. The China got Chinese got swamped, and it's been a known fact that they've been outsourcing. China China has been outsourcing to the Vietnam. Vietnam and India. Okay. okay, well that makes sense then. And so the, I would say I would say this: the product will be better. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it probably the will. The yeah, they know what they're doing over there. Yeah. Are, outstanding yes. quality yes it's a very interesting country they like 98 their literacy rate in vietnam is higher than we have it's like 98.5 percent of the country is literate huh. it's a very interesting place huh. okay onward <laughs> yeah i don't know if that's doing anything but it's not gonna probably i don't know what we're gonna do about china uh, here's an what, what, what we're going to do is what we've been doing is cut them off at the pass, thwart them everywhere we can, and yeah, mess up mess help. up countries where they want to have a foothold for their Belt and Road strategy, and uh, screw Venezuela in the process. No. Here's Which brings me to Venezuela. I'm sorry, I have a China oh, Venezuela. Clip. Venezuela, go with Venezuela. Yes, I do. I have. Uh, Three things from Venezuela. This is from I, NPR. And I have one. I have one. Well, let's, let's play yours first. What do you got? Well, mine is about a, the local protest. Uh, you know, Code Pink. Yeah. Uh, and all the rest of the, and the democracy now and everybody. They're all pro Maduro for some reason. I don't know what. And Code, uh, Print, Code Pink is uh, even protested Obama a lot. They protest everything. Everybody, yeah. But they love Maduro, so they're protesting. Uh, I think you can hire them for anything, so just high is bitter, isn't it? Guaido people in and move the real Venezuelans out, if you want to call them real Venezuelans, as if Guaido isn't. But let's play protests and weirdness at the Venezuelan embassy democracy now. In Washington, D.C., authorities cut off water and electricity to Venezuela's embassy as activists with Code Pink and other organizations continue around the clock occupation in order to prevent a takeover of the building by Venezuela's U.S. backed opposition. The activists entered the embassy in late April at the invitation of Venezuela's government. Opposition groups led by Juan Guaido and backed by the Trump administration have pledged to take over the building. So far, police and Secret Service agents have arrested nine activists, including Jerry Condone, a 72-year-old Vietnam War veteran, and the president of Veterans for Peace, who was violently tackled and pressed to the pavement Wednesday by five officers after he tried to bring food to protesters occupying the embassy. Condone was left bleeding from the head and needed medical treatment, he's been charged with throwing a missile, resisting arrest, and assaulting police officers as he attempted to get food inside the building. Hmm. Did not report it on mainstream. Of no, well, of course not. I just, this just in from one of our lawyers within the Value for Value network. I have been advised, and I, I can confirm that this is, he's the real deal. I've been advised by clients who buy from China as follows. <clears throat> the manufacturers are moving to Vietnam from China, but the P.O. box scam is being perpetrated in Malaysia. So that's how they're rolling. 
Okay. Malaysia. So look for some problems in Malaysia. What can we what can we stir up in Malaysia? Because yeah, that's what it seems to be. We just want to thwart the Chinese. This is Under Secretary of State Tom Shannon on NPR. And this first clip is about the failed coup. I'm sorry, flipping uh, in uh, Venezuela. How do the tools available to the United States tools compare to the vulnerabilities? Up to this point, uh, the tools have not been sufficient. Really beginning on January 23rd, when Juan Guaido declared the presidency vacant and declared himself the president under the Constitution, the hope at the time was that that would be sufficient to flip the military. It did not work. Then the opposition, working with the United States and other countries, decided that focusing on humanitarian assistance and creating a confrontation at the border between Colombia and Venezuela over the delivery of humanitarian assistance Mm -hmm would create a rebellion within the armed forces. That did not work. Then the administration decided that sanctioning the state-run oil company, PDVSA, and effectively sending a clear signal to the armed forces that revenues would be cut off and their access to the Venezuelan gravy train would end would convince the military to flip. That did not work. There's also been an effort to focus on individual members or former members of the military. Some of them have been sanctioned, and just the other day, Vice President and Pence said the U.S. would aim to lift sanctions on an individual former intelligence chief, I believe, who switched sides. Is that working at all? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, the purpose, obviously, is to send the signal that those members of the armed forces that choose to work with the opposition, if they are under sanctions, will have those sanctions lifted. And those who might be facing sanctions would not face them if they chose to work with the opposition. We're going to have to wait and see how that's received. What just amazes me is to listen to this guy cavalierly speak with an NPR host who easily could have been lamenting uh, the Russians meddling in our elections. Listen to this. Listen to that. What tools do you have? Well, this tool didn't work and that tool didn't work. What are you doing? Well, I'm trying to jack Venezuela, obviously. Oh, how about Russia and China? The Russians have provided significant sales of weapons to the Venezuelan government, along with purchasing large quantities of oil and gas and inserting themselves into Venezuela's oil and gas industry. And then the Chinese, of course, also have deep interests in the oil and gas sector. Is there any way to pry those foreign actors away from the Venezuelan government, Maduro's government? <laughs> Is it, that's NPR, your national public radio, is uh, participating in... National uh, st- public radical? Is, yeah, we're strategizing how we can fuck the Chinese. Cut off! We're going to have to wait and see. Um, I personally believe that calling these governments out, especially the Chinese and the Russians, was not intelligent. The Chinese in particular have been looking to play a very low-key role in this political dispute and are more interested in their long-term energy interests. And therefore, it's important for the United States to make very clear to the Chinese that the long-term future of their relationships in South America are going to depend on China's willingness to help Venezuela find a political accommodation that gets it through this period of crisis. Do you mean to say it would have been more intelligent to quietly approach the Chinese and reassure them that their energy interests will be maintained no matter who is running Venezuela? Yes, but also to make clear that countries who have China as a number one trading partner, like Brazil, like Argentina, like Chile, like Peru, want to maintain that relationship. But in order to do so, that the Chinese need to understand that by financing the Maduro government, they are actually creating problems inside of South America, especially the outflow of refugees from Venezuela, that are seriously affecting the stability of countries like Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Chile, and Brazil. There you go. That's that's what we're doing. That's that's your. You don't need to know anything else. We are all over it. Who is that guy? That is the Under Secretary of State Tom Shannon. As Shannon speaketh too much, me thinketh. It's just way out there. Oh yeah, no problem. Yeah, <laughs> you know this. We're getting some other tools. Uh, I thought that was yeah. I agree with you. What is this? What is the point of this? Well, this is not like de- disinformation or a, some sort of. He's a just giving a briefing, leading or anything. You go on NPR and just ex- explain the strategies. And <laughs> this makes no to, sense. To a T. Uh, that must be the way the State Department of State is being run these days. Now, the techno experts that we've discussed, who have uh, targeted us when we talk about Venezuela, and we're not doing it right. We're not talking about them right. 
Um, I'm starting to see some patterns here as there's some young Venezuelan kids, and I say kids in the 20 to 24, 25-year-old range, uh, who put together a video uh, specifically meant for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who, as we know, is all in on uh, Maduro's regime and the, uh, and the socialist country of Venezuela. At least that's the way it's portrayed in the, in the M5M. And, and then this video appears. I'm going to play a little bit of it first. You get the idea. Let me tell you something, Alexandria. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I want to tell you something. El socialismo no funciona. El socialismo no funciona. My name is Jose. I'm 21 years old. I am Samuel Machado. I'm 22 years old. I fled real socialism. Me and my family fled real socialism. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Alexio Ocasio-Cortez. You're a liar. You are a liar. You don't know what you're talking about. You're clueless. You have never gone through socialism, so you preach it like you do. America will never be a socialist country. America will never be a socialist country. <coughs> a lot of people think socialism, it's all about equality and free stuff. What socialism is really about, it's starvation. People dying from lack of medicine. Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, I want to... He's, he, now, just notice that the lack of who, medicine, all the talking points yeah, are here. Who, who produces the oh, Jose um, Birch Society? No. This is why I was interested in sharing this. It goes on for about three minutes. Um, just one, 30 more seconds to hear some of the other points you've heard in this type of campaign. It's really about it's starvation. People dying from lack of medicine. Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, I want to tell you something. If you really believe in socialism, why are you here in the U.S.? Why don't you move to Venezuela, Cuba, Russia, Afghanistan, China? Why don't you just go there? You know... You talk about socialism as it is something so perfect, but you know it's not. Well, no, actually, you really truly believe that, that it works like that, but it doesn't. Just go and look at the actual facts and not just the books. Isn't it good to have your life going every day to Starbucks, tweeting how much you hate capitalism from your MacBook? That's great, right? Okay, so when I hear these things, you know, like, isn't it great drinking your Starbucks uh, and uh, tweeting how much you hate capitalism on your MacBook? I'm like, okay, these are talking points. I've heard them before. Uh, and they sound a lot with that medicine thing and Maduro. It sounds a lot like the emails we received. This is produced and distributed by Turning Point USA, home of Candace Owens and Charlie Kirk. Yeah. These are the propagandists, and now I'm starting to think maybe it was their uh, their outfit that sent us emails. Who would know about podcasts? Who would stay on top of that? I was giving the U.S. State Department too much credit, I think. So these may be the actors. And how does this fit in with what I thought Turning Point USA was? I don't know. I never heard of them. Well, you know Candace Owens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, she's with the, the Blexit. I, I like Candace Owens. I like the, the. I like what she does. I like what she does for Prager University. But what is this? What, what is, these, these guys are. It's a Turning Point USA. This is. This is propagandistic crap, and I can't take them very seriously after hearing this. What do well, we, what do we know about it is them? Prob- it's, it's just like the those horrible Democrat. Uh, the celebrity ones where the celebrity just Democrats as bad. Yeah, up. yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying, I think we have to change the color of blue to green. <laughs> yes. It's Stuff like black that. and white. You know? Stuff like that. Or just some black and white, too, probably. Well, I'm going to look into look a little deeper into Turning Point and see if uh, I know Charlie Kirk is. And I thought he's he's just I don't know. I thought they were kind of a good outfit, but this just uh Propaganda. Just propaganda sour. crap. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, very sour. And with that, I would like to thank you for your courage and say in the morning to you, the man who put the C in Chicom, John C. Devore. In the morning to you, Mr. Adam Curry. In the morning, I'll ship his sea boots on the ground, feet in the air, subs in the water, and all the names and nights out there. In the morning to our troll room, all trolls always welcome 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Noagendastream.com is where you can listen to the live stream, and it is often actually live, interactions live, like it is on Thursdays and Sundays when we're on the microphone. And you can get in there, you can do all kinds of stuff. You can troll, you can... Uh, troll some more and then just troll or you could also be helpful sometimes that does happen uh, no yeah. what you okay why does anybody want to be helpful 
Oh, no, that would be a bad idea. And in the morning to, uh, let me see. I believe it was, yes, Darren O'Neill, who brought us the artwork for episode 1136, 1136 episodes. That episode was titled Spy Slut, which is a CIA term we learned on the show. And Darren O'Neill, uh, oh, yes, he brought us uh, the a fine example of what you don't like at a Whole Foods checkout line. Someone with <laughs> t- face tattoos, <laughs> blown out ear earlobes. And uh, I think in this case, both Darren and I, I'm and girl. Darren and we, kind of went for the, the cheapest laugh, I guess. Is that what we would classify this as? Well, now that you mention it, it's I mean, kind of going for the now cheap. We, laugh. Now that you started this, this analysis, <laughs> uh, nose ring, look, mustache, look, yeah. what you saw in this this piece of art. Now, this art, okay, there was a bunch of stuff that was actually it, it was all borderline. I mean, the, the 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 kind of the funniest, sickest one was the Black Royal. Uh, which was yes. their extremely Uncle cave bear, extremely, had, extremely racist. <laughs> the racist, the, yes, racist piece. I like the mental health one the most, but it was, was like more of an evergreen. It didn't really have much to do with anything. Uh, the cat with the uh, with the phone uh, is funny, but not pertinent to the show. The thing was that we, as we looked over these, the only thing that was pertinent to the show was the mustachioed uh, character. Yeah. So that's what we, that's really the reason we picked it. And um, someone else made a, an email comment to us that the artwork is really just part of a, a package of three elements of promotion. And I, I want to bring that up because it does work in concert. We have the album art, we have the show title, and we have the opening blurb at the beginning of the show. And... Each one of those three elements is important uh, in in promoting each new a new episode. Personally, I think the yeah, t- title is yes. Go and, ahead. And we have made a rule, just not yes, true, uh, arbitrary. Rest, it's your rule. It's your rule. You can't cross over. Yeah, you can't have the the artwork be the same or have the same topic as the title and right. the opening giblet can't be related to the other two either i don't know yeah. why we came up with the why i yeah, was you. put this yeah, in was place you. but i like it, it makes us <clears throat> well makes once us, it became established mm-hmm. because at some point i think we did have a couple of contrary well let's call it this oh, that's what the artworks is doing um once it became established we just kind of said okay well we this is what we're gonna do we can do it it's not like it's impossible <clears throat> no People really want to hear that conversation. I should record it when we're discussing artwork and titles. <clears throat> well, it's recorded. You just recorded it. No, I mean the actual process. Oh, maybe. One of the things we've noticed with the artwork, since we're discussing it, <clears throat> is people try to guess. Oh, yeah, the topic that we will be interested in as art, yes. Yeah, and so if, the, so if we never mention it, and we get to the artwork, say, oh, this guy just did, we didn't talk about it. It's, it, it. What's a disappointment is sometimes it's like a s- superior piece of art. We say, wow, what a great piece of art. It's too bad we didn't talk about this. <laughs> that, that, yes, that does indeed happen. <laughs> like, damn it, we, quite a bit. we missed the topic. Yeah. Uh, but predicting what we're going to talk about and Pete Buttigieg being called Alfred E. Newman by President Trump. It's not on my list. Not, is not something we were ever going to talk about. No, no, not, Man, not at least not on this show. No, I don't think so. I will say that the art that was done here uh, that makes him look like Alfred E. Newman is outstanding. It's well done, yes. <laughs> it looks yeah. just like him. Yeah, we'll probably go for a mom thing. I think that, that's pretty obvious. Mom is, good, mom good, is yeah. always good. Mom is always safe. Safe bet. Safe bet. All right. So let's get to our donations. Here. Yes, this is uh, our value for value system. You listen, you determine if you got any value out of, value out of the show. If so, kick it back, put and, it into so the network. As far as you think in a value and a Mother's Day show, uh, we have one executive producer and one associate executive producer, and that's that all we got. Luckily, the executive producer came in with a thousand dollars flat. This is uh, Jason Owen, Sir Lowenbrow of the High Ground in Brookfield, Wisconsin. 
And he came in with $1,000 and said, ITM, gentlemen, thank you for your continued diligence in the value for value model. I've been listening to the show for many of your earth years. Since season one, I've received, I've been receiving value. My home planet suffers from a Zika-like genetic deformity where most citizens are born with teeny, tiny little heads and small mouths. <laughs> this makes it very easy for my people to then keep their collective heads up their asses year round. Sounds like uh, places I've been to. <clears throat> Florida. Mm. Uh, having traveled the universe i can say that the Mueller report is correct in deeming this the best podcast in the universe <laughs> i find myself today at disneyland on mother's day without my wife and three daughters i am a douchebag douchebag in that past my wife made an instant night donation in my name on father's day my wife is an unbelievably amazing he must be at a convention or something something like that yeah that, that would be because i've been to these places and they usually have some pretty wild events. Yes. My wife is an unbelievably amazing woman and since her donation, uh, has survived cancer, multiple, I'm sorry, I missed the line there. Uh, survived cancer, multiple health issues and surgeries, family tragedies and continues to put up with me. She also still uses squirrel mail. Yes. <laughs> Whoa, and now that's a woman card. right there, baby. Yeah, <laughs> squirrel mail and punch cards. <laughs> despite attempts to upgrade. Woo! Please accept my instant donate. I should tell my punch card stories from the University of California days. Please accept my instant donations in her name. May she be known as Dame Shay Shay with coffee and Kringles at the round table. And may I please have an F cancer? You've got karma and L G Y hugs and kisses, sir. Low and brow of the grant of the high ground. Uh, he says, I, m "I mightily enjoy your pronunciation of places in Wisconsin almost as much as Adam enjoys your Dutch. I hope to provide you with <laughs> pronunciation giblets giblets soon." Okay. So here's the only thing. Uh, this was not on my uh I'm an instruction list that I got from the shill this morning, so I have to fill it in uh, manually. I know she wants to be called Dame Shay Shay, but do we have a name for her? Like a like her actual name or first name? Do I have anything? Uh, I would I don't say see it. Mrs. Owens. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Mrs. Owens. There we go. Mrs. Owens becomes Dame Shay Shay. And she needs coffee and Kringle at the round table. Yeah, we got that covered for you, so we'll give you an LGY. I'll, of course, we'll see uh, Mrs. Owens at the, uh, at the round table later on. Uh, let me see. What does she want there? F cancer, LGY. Yeah, I think we got that. You've got karma. All righty. And our associate executive executive producer, Sarah Butterick, in Beaver Creek, Ohio, 214.27. And she says, first and for foremost, I'd like a thorough de-douching. Okay. <laughs> thorough. You've been de-douched. Yeah, we got all the cracks with that one. Secondly, I'd like to give a shout out to my smoking hot husband, Sir Ladyfingers, Baron of the Miami Valley. May 12th is our first wedding anniversary. Aww. At one point, he said he wasn't sure he would marry someone who wasn't working on her damehood. <laughs> Better late than never, I guess. <laughs> it's a good start. Thank, thank you both for the brilliant twice weekly media deconstruction. You keep us wacky millennials sane. <laughs> Love and light, Sarah Butterick. Well, happy anniversary. <clears throat> yes, love and light to you. She wants, we're all going to die. That's true. And a goat scream. I'll combine that with a karma. We're all going to die. That's true. <laughs> You've got karma. And that was it. And those are our people, our associate executive producer and executive producer for show 1137. Yes. Well, both of you have a very valuable credit which you can use anywhere credits are recognized. And we suggest you do just that. Now, especially for um, Sir Lowenbrow, and he's gonna, he, he gave his donation to his missus, who will be a dame. I mean, that's something you might want to consider putting out there, that you're a, a dame of the No Agenda Roundtable. It's no small feat. F-E-A-T. No. Most of the dames have small feet. <clears throat> which it's is true. Yes, it's an odd, yeah. yes. 
Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Sir Lowenbrow and Sarah Butterick, uh, both of you, for being our executive and associate executive producers of the No Agenda Show. We'd like to do it just like Hollywood, give those credits up front and early, but we will be thanking everybody $50 and above later on. And please remember that we're here as a service. All you have to do is keep us going. Go to Dvorak.org. Slash N A. And you too can continue the deconstruction. Like, who else knows what's going on in Venezuela? Our formula is this we go out, we hit people in the mouth. Wow! Shut up, Slade. European Parliament elections are coming up. And yeah. uh, it's very it's odd funny. because due to the lag of lag of Brexit, uh, the uh, the European parties are in, and uh, and they 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 can vote on uh, European representation since Brexit is Brexit breakfast since breakfast is <laughs> breakfast is not yet done. Uh, the European Union and just explaining this is is kind of complicated, and but I think it's interesting to do it without the visuals because the European Union had a little cartoon. Uh, to explain exactly how it works. That, do you know how these European Parliament elections work? Uh, I, I'd be remiss if I said I absolutely knew, but I don't. Well, I find it to be rather confusing. I'm sure... I mean, that's a, somehow Farage gets in is all I know. <laughs> that's a, the end of the day, Farage is in. This year's European elections. It's a big deal. I love this um, kind of Eurocentric British accent. It's very different from uh, from what you hear in, in the UK. That's very different than a real British accent. Yeah, it is. It's it's just it's very Eurocentric. Oddly oppish. Yeah, they got a whole room full of these people in Brussels who do nothing but these voiceovers. But it's not simple. Not. To help you get your head around them, we've put together this handy explainer. Confusingly, different parts of the EU use different voting systems, but all are some form of proportional representation. Some vote for parties who have selected a fixed list of candidates to appear on the ballot paper. Other countries have more open lists where voters choose a party or indicate who is their favourite candidate. Here, electors choose as many candidates as they like and number them by preference. Turnout at EU elections has dropped from 62% to 42% over the last four decades. Because you made it so easy, that's why. That's despite a handful of countries, including Belgium, Greece and Bulgaria, where voting is compulsory. (laughs) MEPs are elected to represent geographical areas. Regions in some countries, like Italy, while in others, such as Germany, they have the whole country as their constituency. The number each country gets is proportional to its population. Now, this is kind of interesting. When you hear the difference, and it's just—it's a base. It's pretty much the way our House of Representatives works, except they don't have the uh, the concept of a Senate with some equal power. So here it's just whoever has the biggest rules. Germany, the most populous, will get 96 MEPs for its 82.8 million people, while tiny Malta, with 475,000 people, has just six. They will serve a five-year term, 2019 to 2024, and spend their time between European parliaments in Strasbourg and Brussels. They pass EU laws and approve its budget, along with the European Council. MEPs, while representing countries or regions, sit in transnational groups in the parliament, according to political ideology. For example, there are groupings to represent the centre-right, socialists, greens, and others for Eurosceptics. MEPs also help choose the president of the European Commission. The largest political grouping after May's election has the strongest mandate to have its choice head up the Commission. The European Council, (laughs) comprising chiefs of EU countries, first votes on a nominee chosen after taking into account the election result. If they approve the candidate, it goes to the European Parliament, where he or she must get the support of a majority of MEPs. This is so convoluted. I don't, I don't think it's anyone, crazy. I don't think anyone it's in dumb. Europe. It's 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 like what your eyes glaze over, man. Yeah, I, I did. I don't. I still don't understand it. Especially with that background music. And is that meant to make me feel calm while trying to comprehend? So everyone has a different system. Everyone does it differently. And then you throw a whole bunch of people out there, and then they all those people then go and determine who they, which could be a totally rando. They could bring in to be the president of the European uh, Parliament, yeah. and then you, uh, the, and then you get the. Uh, 
Well, good luck. Every every country and every union gets the cover- government she deserves, and you're getting all. Um, yeah. but it's one not really the government. No. It's a scam. So as I'm looking around, since there's no news in America, at least I didn't feel anything really that newsworthy, I wound up watching Euronews. And Euronews had a number of stories about Samos, the island of Samos, which is a Greek island. Um, but it's an, it's, a, it's an odd one because it is almost, it's so far off the coast of Greece, it is actually very close to Turkey. And, uh, you know, you could hop a, you know, hop a little boat to get from uh, the coast of Turkey to this Greek island. And what has happened is Samos has been used as a parking place for migrants who want to come into Europe uh, and are just being held there because the European Union is like, yeah, yeah, we, we've got enough people. And we, remember, they kind of closed some borders here and there and whatever. Don't look at Greece. You know, Greece really doesn't count because, you know, they... They got no no money. We don't care about them. So Greece is pretty much the dumping site of the EU. And they had... <laughs> well, I'm going to play the, uh, the first piece here about... Um, yeah, about what's happening and the numbers of what's taking place. And then there was a 20-minute piece, which I pulled one little specific piece out of. Here's the, here's the basic story of Samos talking to a person who set up a community center for these thousands of, of refugees living in a tent city with uh, no sanitation, no garbage disposal, no sanitation, and no toilets, zero. Zero toilets. The situation hasn't uh, improved uh, in, in any way. Right now, uh, there's over 3,300 people on Samos. The capacity of the camp is 650. Uh, the delays on the asylum procedures are extremely long. Um, we've seen recently people getting uh, interview dates for 2022, even someone for 2023 for their appeal, which is... Yeah, so they're sitting in, and, and these are UN, UNICEF, actually, it says on the side, UNICEF tents. and With no, no toilets, anywhere. no, no, no. The people just pooping on the perimeter. Hmm. Um. And, and, you know, they're next to farmlands and, and uh, all kinds of stuff like this. And these people are saying, I've been here for eight months. I can't live here for another year and a half before I get my, si- my asylum hearing. So I'm going to go crazy. And, of course, there's all kinds of crime now taking place. Incredibly long. This is um, having people waiting for such a long period of time without uh, any clear information, without knowing what's going to happen with them, without having a, a, a proper in, um, uh, process where they can, uh, integration process in place, or having a possibility to work and provide for themselves, it really uh, affects people, especially their mental health, uh, and uh, this causes a lot of distress. It, it doesn't look that things are going to change anytime soon because the system in place is, is broken right now. Um, well, if we look at the EU-Turkey deal, it has never properly worked. This is the EU-Turkey deal where if someone um, uh, came in to uh, the EU, uh, could not rightfully claim asylum, uh, the EU paid several billion euros to Turkey to take them back. Uh, we remember, I remember we covered this. We're like, oh yeah, just send them back, no problem. Well, that's not working out because they're not being sent back. They're not being accepted, even though you could almost toss them over, over off the island. They could swim back to Turkey. Um, well, if we look at the EU-Turkey deal, it has never properly worked. Um, people were supposed to, their cases were supposed to be treated very quickly. And like the hotspot is supposed to be like a, um, a, a triage point where people are that are uh, supposed to get asylum, they, they are allowed to stay, and those that are rejected their asylum, they would should be quickly uh, returned to uh, uh, Turkey or to their home country. Right now, what, what, what's happening is uh, people are, are just waiting for months or years for their asylum procedure to be completed, and... Uh, without knowing what's going to happen. Even if they get a rejection, they are still staying here for a very, very long time. Uh, and so, you know, there was a piece about some people who have a, their little house there, and, and they're literally on the other side of the fence, and 
and they're feeding some of these people as they can. You see the slop that they're getting that passes for food is just, it's, I mean, this inhumane, animalistic circumstances makes you really think that our putting kids in cages is a good deal when you see this. And is the EU helping out? Right now, the policy of the European Union is to send the big chunk of money to the Greek government. But the money does not reach the people on the ground. It's not acceptable that someone has to live on a, in a tent for eight months, a year, a year and a half, uh, with like no sanitation, no protection, no uh, uh, proper food, uh, looking at the most vulnerable, like babies or children or a pregnant woman. There is one, like, they, they have to live on a, on a tent for a long period of time but like yeah there is a lot of money sent but the, the money does not reach the ground so a lot of the initiatives like this one that you see like our our group we work a lot only on private donations yeah so that sounds like it's going extremely well so next time we have anyone in the european union criticize us of our immigration policies i'd like you to focus on the island of samos as they have done something and the, what they've done is they've determined it would be better to move this camp a couple miles uh, up the road, so it's further away from the main drag, the main city. Uh, Unfortunately, that puts it exactly half a mile from a little village, (laughs) a little picturesque village on the island of Samos in Greece. And what Euronews did in this 20-minute piece, you know how they'll have someone talk and they'll just voice over it like, you know, uh, a a translation? You know, overdubbing, I guess is what, what they'd call it. Yeah. Well, now it's like a complete radio play, so, so and with emotion. So they have a um, couple of people at this you know impromptu town meeting, and it's you know a couple old guys, a couple old ladies, and they're all yelling. But you, know, you don't know what they're saying. But they've chopped it all together with the Euro News translated voices. But they're acting. And I realized this is like a radio play. The Greek government has promised to close down the Vathi refugee center soon and to open a new and bigger one a few kilometers away from the capital. Georgios is the president of the village of Mitilini, next to which the new camp is set to be built. Here are the former slaughterhouses, where the migrant center is set to be installed. And here you can see where my community is. The distance is one kilometer, so you can understand that the problem of Vathi will come to our village. The topic has inflamed the community. A group of villagers is expecting us. We do not let them go to the destination they want to go to, and we are keeping them here by force. And so they are giving us their misery. I mean, their misery becomes ours. They just can't be people wandering around without us knowing who they are. They might be criminals, thieves, or rapists. We don't want them here. That's the issue. They can take them wherever they want, but here we don't want them. That's it. We cannot live with those people. They have 800 diseases. If you go to the hospital, it is full of black people. We know they steal. We can't live with them. We will take the law into our own hands. Quite possibly. This all sounds racist. We are not. Please don't associate us with this term. But we've had it up to here. Europe has closed its borders and it is Greece that has paid the price for it. Those Europeans who take and give orders. Can't they understand that the only thing they are going to achieve is the rise of the far right? Little by little they are pushing us to the extremes. This is what Europe has succeeded in. This is what you should tell them. <laughs> I don't know. I, th- wow. I thought it was kind of cool as a, as a radio play. Yeah. That's funny. Well, yeah, they can bitch and moan about what we do, but that's got to be a mess over there. This whole thing is a joke. You know, I'm reminded, I was listening to all this as you were just playing these clips, and I'm thinking, you know, the Europeans really don't have a culture to do, to manage the EU uh, in the formation of the of the United States, it, the, even when we had 13 colonies, let alone when we started expanding, mm-hmm. if you read the literature from that era, the Europeans scoffed at what we were up to, especially when we went independent and decided to become one big group, uh, as opposed to the small colonies that were all owned by different parts of Europe in many ways or in slightly independent, but not too far, uh, was that it, it, at the point of the of 1776 era, it was believed that the country was too big to manage. This is going to be the downfall of the United States is that these 13 colonies, you can't manage. It's too much. It'll never work. Yes, exactly. 
And so the uh, there was all of the agreement. The French would say that, the Brits would say that, the, everybody. It was too big. I mean, look at the size of you know some of our countries, and there's it's already too big. Meanwhile, so they go from that kind of thinking over hundreds of years, and they don't change it into one language. They don't do anything in Europe to to make it easier. They still have all their separate little languages, yep. and they decide to make one big monstrosity and try to manage it with a bunch yeah. of bureaucrats running yeah. it out of Belgium. Does this make any sense to anybody historically? No, no. no. And by the way, in um, in the Netherlands, there's this, there's a, a smallish town <clears throat> that has a, a local newspaper, and the local newspaper was not allowed by the authorities uh, to inform the community that there would be a new um, asylum seeker center that would be set up right near their town. This is how but bad it is. It over. What? How did that go over? Not very well. In fact, the entire um, news desk uh, quit the paper. The paper quit itself, pretty much. Why? What's the paper got to do with it? Because they were not allowed to publish this news. They were forbidden from publishing this news. So no one there knew about it until all of a sudden uh, they start building this center. Like, well, what is this? Well, they're going to have asylum seekers over here. Which, of course... In liberal Europe, everybody loves people coming seeking asylum, but you know where we don't want it. <laughs> yeah, NIMBY. NIMBY, exactly. Yeah. Well, well, I do have some news from over here. Really? I got Stuff kind of, happened, okay. I have a couple of clips that bother me because there's missing information. All right. This one here is the Barge Report uh, from CBS, where we had a, a, a little spill. Late this afternoon, two barges and an oil tanker collided in a shipping channel in Houston. One of the barges capsized after a hole opened up in its side. It was carrying about 25,000 barrels of a toxic chemical used to make gasoline. Some of that has wow. spilled into the water. Hmm. That's not good. When you hear that, what, do you th- what, what goes through your mind so far as information what information did was kind of not told was left out it seems well whose barge was this well that's one of them yeah that would be nice to know <laughs> that would be interesting to know yes uh well don't you think you have you don't you have aren't you even curious about what toxic chemical has gotten into the water nah it's houston who gives a shit well, there's well besides that. Let's say it was someplace oh, else. Oh, okay. Let's say it, anything but Houston. Yeah, I'd be interested. Do we know? Have we figured it out? Do we know at all what's uh, happening with this? Broken. If you go look at the news reports, this was <laughs> even more interesting. Instead of a toxic chemical, like this I'll set. I'll read you some headlines from various stories. Barge leaks gasoline product in Houston ship. Oh, channel. I know what it is. Barge and tanker collide, leaking gas product. Mm-hmm. Ship product. Barge is causing massive <laughs> gas product. Holy crap. We're going to die. What is this stuff? Well, what it turns out to be, if you do a little research. Oh, I know what it is. You don't even get into it in these news stories either. They just call it reformate. I know what it is. I know what it is. is It's the stuff that turns the frogs gay. (laughs) No. Oh. That's uh, atrazine. Ah, Right. Atrazine. Um, Yes. Atrazine. And it's not used in petroleum products. No, it's called, they call it, all these news articles talk about it as reformate. Reformate is just kind of a witch's brew of crap that comes off of various catalytic reform. Uh, uh, so it's uh, a waste powers. It's a waste product? No, it's not a waste product. No. It's all high-end stuff. Oh, it's the good but stuff. But it's all mixed up. So you mm. have toluene and naphthene. naphthene you got uh, benzene, which is the is carcinogenic. Xylene. That. Xylene. Xylene, a lot of xylene. Yeah. So you have all these aromatics and some benzene and some other chemicals. All it's a witch's brew, mm-hmm. and it makes the it's used to boost the octane uh-huh. of normal gasoline. <laughs> That's some supercharged uh, fish in Houston, then. Well, it's the thing that was left out of the report, in my opinion, is the fact that benzene, which is highly carcinogenic, was leaked into the water, and nobody's <clears throat> talking about it. Damn, and not so. just a little bit. So no, this is tons. So this is a cover up then, because other. I mean, th- and just it's, even it's I know poor report, it's poor reporting. No, it's it's it sounds Don't more like the, uh, the public's going to get all bent out of shape if you say that. So yeah, don't want to get the public bent out of shape about the fact you got a bunch of benzene in the water, which Damn. is not a good product. No, um, but yeah, but the way they cover it up, toxic and it's, you know, toluene is not. These things aren't that. There's they're yeah, but, all over the but, place. But, but this stuff will get into. Gas, 
be able to yeah. get into the water supply eventually, won't it? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, most of it evaporates. No. It's all high end. I mean, it's all very volatile, so it'll go away. Oh, uh, so not that big a problem. No, no. If you boil the channel, <laughs> the stuff will come right off. <laughs> it'll, don't worry. Just boil your arm. It'll, it'll rub right off. That's already say. I always tell people, you know, if you're going to use these hexane, you know, most uh, most oils. I don't want to get into a lecture on this, but most oils that you get, unless they're specifically say expeller or crushed, depends on how how the oil is made. But you know, first uh, virgin olive oil, uh, first press is pressed, and then a lot of a lot of oils are expellers, and expellers spin it around. And it comes out of the yeah. seeds and whatever. Mm-hmm. But most oil production, like like the mazola, the giant gallons of oil that you get yes. it tends to be a hexane extractor which is the easiest way to pull oil out of nuts and fruits and whatever you pull in the seeds mm. whatever you pull in the oil out of is you extract with hexane make a mash put hexane in there flash it off and you end up with some oil the problem is there's always res- i believe i believe that there's no way you can flash all the hexane off and so you end up with a uh some residual hexane in the oils. Ah. And now a lot of the natural food fanatics, oh my God, you can't use these oils for anything. You can use these oils. I also believe, based on just basic chemistry, that if you, you yeah, if you take the corn oil that's been hexane extracted and you use it in your salad dressing, you're probably going to ingest some. So you don't use that. You use olive oil. Olive oil, of course, of course. We don't use... Now, but if you're going to use it for making French fries, once you heat that oil up to 320 or plus degrees, it, that, if there's any residual in there, it's gone. So it's safe. So do I go Just long like oil you. or short based upon your... I don't know. <laughs> I love how you know... I love you to throw out the... Based on basic uh, chemistry, you lost me at, at chem. Yeah, basic well, chemistry. They, you know, yeah. things flash off and that's Dude, what uh, now does that work with chicks no it turns out no, uh unless they're chemi- chemistry nerds right it seems unlikely doesn't really work okay. anywhere with any of them yeah i just wanted to make sure no it's not a chick magnet okay. thing you remember i'm just doing it for people out there who like to cook and they're always yes. you know they read about this and that about ex- you know these overpriced expeller oils um I mean, I cook, yeah, I try to cook, when I French fry, I try to cook in safflower or sunflower oil, mm-hmm. which is a, a really good oil for deep fat frying. I've gotten uh, kind of hooked on the sorghum syrup. <laughs> I know, it, it's, well, it, growing up in Holland, uh, in the Netherlands, for breakfast, there's, there's really, uh, certainly younger kids will have a slice of bread, or maybe two slices, uh, buttered up, or margarine actually, uh, and then they'd either put chocolate uh, flakes on there or chocolate sprinkles. They can also do they can do the colored sprinkles, but also molasses, just spreading molasses on top of the butter. Right. And uh, I grew up eating that. Uh, or they can go the other way and have a piece of bread again with the margarine slash butter. Then slices of young aged Gouda cheese. That would be another another fan favorite. Uh, in the morning, but also for lunch. But I uh, saw, so, you know, and I just took a piece of bread and I put some some butter on it, and I tried, I put the sorghum syrup, and oh my god, it took me back. It's delicious. <laughs> it's delicious. It, you know, it sounds like it should taste like poop. Sorghum. That doesn't sound appealing, but when yeah, you try it's it, funny. it's good, man. I had a sorghum pancake for breakfast today. We should try my sorghum syrup on your sorghum pancake. Uh, you know, I like, you know, the one great delicacy that the United States has pretty much locked and Jemima. down in Canada. <laughs> and Jemima. Is is maple syrup, not yeah. Aunt Jemima. Aunt Jemima is a got sugar water. <laughs> fructose corn syrup and all kinds of crap in it. Who knows what's in there? But a real 100% maple syrup uh, is a, is a, it's a, a delicacy a and it's rather cheap considering yes. how rare and valuable it is. Around the world, it's very expensive. Yeah. So, all right, back to off of the food thing. Okay, well, uh, just a few updates. Jussie Smollett will not return to Empire for next season. He's done. Oh, he's on again, off again. No, I guess now it's off. I guess they, you know, 
they uh, Fox is Fox, yeah, yeah. Fox uh, made their decision, said no, nah, it's not worth it, so he's off. Good liar. Yeah, good. Um, Would Bert, you like fries with that? Who Bernie Sanders time? and AOC are calling for the creation of government-owned banks run by the U.S. Post Office. And I wanted to say, I've, I've, uh, well, would we you could, like your savings in stamps? Well, I've used this system when I, when I was growing up, it was quite popular in the Netherlands and it was called post hero. And you literally did your banking at the post office, or you could do it through the mail, which was free. And you filled out your little card for payments and, uh, and it's still there and you can still, uh, now they do it online, but it's what, what interests me is why don't they promote uh, credit unions, we, it, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a government-run thing for it to be more of a non-profit model and a bank that's not trying to screw you over, or at least is being honest about it and not getting back-end deals for the worse they screw you. And that's a credit union. And we have them all over the United States. And, and, yeah. and, and they are community banking to its maximum. And you don't have yeah, to be it, in it a union. Out. Yeah. But uh, the having a banking system within uh, the post office it's i mean i don't know if we could do it with our with our postal system but it's not a bad idea necessarily i've seen it work lines i've seen it work yeah you've seen it work but a lot of post offices because they're little fiefdoms in the united states yeah it'd be some issue with customer service oh well i mean just like me i don't have a mailbox so just imagine like you move like sorry you don't have any money (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, we we don't we don't know where your where your money account is is gone. So yeah. I cut another clip that is I, I consider something of a gaffe, or maybe not. I'm not sure, but it would seem to me that if you were a news reader and you were an or an expert, or you remember the woman who was the head of Planned Parenthood, the kind of the yes, yeah, Cecile Rogers. Uh, yes, yeah, Cecile Rogers. No, well, no, not, not not wait, wait, some, no, 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 Rogers, Cecile um, Richards. Richards, yes. I, I like. Yeah. I've always liked her. I she's thought, Ann Richards' daughter. If yes. you remember. It. Yes, yeah. I do. Yeah, from the Texas government. Well, she's governor. starting to look. She's starting. I hate you. you I know what you were going to say. She's attractive, except no more recently, having been booted out of Planned Parenthood, she really is starting to look like George Soros. <laughs> oh man! Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I saw her recently. Now. I I didn't catch the Soros vibe. Yes. Yes. <laughs> she's getting that Sith look for you. <laughs> For your Star Wars folk. Yeah, she's starting to look Sith. So, so, I mean, that's, you know, a a drawback. But she was on with Amy, and there's a little gaffe in here. I want to see if you can spot it. Um, I don't know that you you will, but you might. But I I did immediately, and I had to go back and say, oh, what is bull crap? How can you not know this? Okay, let's have a listen. Uh, and anyone who wants to be elected has to respond to the issues that women care about. Um, and so that'll be a lot of the organizing work we're doing, both online and offline, in the coming months. Um, four Democratic women have now announced their plans to run for president. The significance of this for you, and will you be endorsing? I think the importance of, obviously, there's there's no way to overstate the importance of women running for president, and I'm thrilled uh, that they are, and I think they're raising issues that have long been uh, been needed to be raised. Uh, I, I think it's it's disturbing to see what I believe is a real double standard in how they are being treated versus the many, many, many men that are running for president. You know, two thirds of political reporting is still done by men. And so I'm hoping that both through supermajority, through other folks that follow the media, we can actually be lifting up the important work that these women have done. As you probably know, these are women who, um, in large part, have never lost a political race. And so when people talk about women being unelectable, I think it's really important to look at their record because it stands up uh, really in contrast to a lot of the, fo- the a lot of the men who are actually uh, in, in the race right now. Hmm. Um, who is she working for now? Oh, it's some it's got it's like you look her up. You should some or some. It's like a not a lobbying group, but it's some you know NGO kind of an operation. And why did she leave? I don't know. Planned I can't remember that, that. But the, the point of the clip was more about the gaffe, which I think was inexcusable, considering we have Amy, who's a news reader and knows that knows should know about this because it's about they're talking about women politicians, and 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 Richard should have said something. So what was the gaffe? 
there are four women running for president is the gaffe. There's five. Uh, <laughs> okay. I I'm, consider it a huge gaffe. If you're a woman <laughs> and you're all for women running for the... All right, name counting. them now. Name if, if them now. Hillary, it would be six, but Hillary's not running. There are five, no. not four. And okay. I think it was they, I think they purposely forget one. And I think the one they keep forgetting is Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard, Gabbard I, yes. They don't even consider her a contender for some reason. Yes, they 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 eschew her. That is and so, so they, weird. So they stick a thumb in her eye, and, and they just, they say four. The four they're talking about is is Klobuchar, Harris, uh, Warren, and and Gillibrand. Right. And the fifth one is Tulsi Gabbard. That's so rude. But it's not it's not unexpected, you know. I've all, first of all, I like and, Tulsi and by Gabbard. The way, Tulsi Gabbard is the only anti-war one, and we're talking about the war and <laughs> that's peace what I'm saying. <laughs> that's the whole point. Like, I like Tulsi Gabbard a lot. I've liked her since we first became aware of her five years ago, maybe six years ago. And said, so, no, she could totally be president, but her message is wrong. She she hates war. As a veteran, she's been in war, and so that's wrong. But she also has. A yeah, she has zero stage presence. She she's very. I mean, she's stately and she speaks thoughtfully and slowly. But who gives a crap? No one cares. No one wants that anymore. We need to see no. fire no, and passion. People. Yes, 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 yes. We need fire and passion and and uh, pissed offness. And now she doesn't have any of that. But for her to just be excluded by these top women is well, very I, I lame. Can't say that she's the one they excluded. Well, for sure, because yeah. they never mention names, no, but, but it's you know. obvious to me. Yeah, that's I what's agree going with on. you. I agree with you. So yeah. there's only four women running. Yeah, yeah, bull crap. And I'm looking at her Wikipedia page, but oh, what is no? It doesn't say where she's currently working. It's some. It's some weird organization. I'd like to know what happened there because I thought she was on. I actually thought she was on her way into politics. It seemed like she would be perfect to. To, to do some good in the Democratic Party. Yeah, it must have been some scandal no one ever wanted to bring out. Something's going on. Yeah, maybe we just missed that. If you dodge the needle from measles, that's illegal. For if you catch the measles, you will die. Die, die, die. Yes, yes. Tracking the measles because it's just so much fun to do. Uh, we spread over to Europe 100,000 people with the measles. Just tell them how important it is to have well, it is, it, I mean, measles is a, is a horrible disease and it can kill it does spread very very quickly and so the only way to protect yourself is to make sure you've had the full course of vaccine and it's never too late uh, just because your child is a little bit older now they can still go and get their vaccine from the gp yes everyone go get your shots get your booster get your who booster. didn't get these shots how do you get all these people getting infected these shots are distilled water I think this is a scam. <laughs> I, you know i'm with you it's like everyone's so worried now we know that if you've been inoculated you cannot get you cannot get it again. If you've had it, you cannot get it again. But now there's these wishy washy. You need a booster, ninety four, ninety seven. Look, if you if you protected by the vaccine, then what are you worried about? Why is everybody freaking out? Hey, Alabama County Fair. Oh my. There was a, a five-month-old baby. She had the measles. Everybody freak out. Live at five, we first broke this. Four. Live at five. We were on the four. The new information that the testing for that St. Clair County baby presumed to have measles was negative. Alan negative. Collins oh, my God. Woo. Down Woo. Oh, yeah. Sigh of relief. Woo. Information from Alabama's Department of Health. What'd you find out, Alan? Well, those are the results. And you remember, we've been saying this all along. You know, while there was concern she might have had it. measles, we're talking about that five-month-year-old infant over in St. Clair County. But, you know, tests had to be done. It had to be done by the CDC. The tests were done. There were eventually the public health department releasing like this afternoon. It might be a rash of some sort, but it's definitely not measles. Oh, now, woo! we can tell you the public health department, they are investigating about investigating. 80 cases going right now in Alabama as an investigation. The public health department has already dismissed 170 of those investigation and cases. Again, those were not measles. State the health, of, health officials. We've been- that must be that fifth disease that, that, the, that we were talking about. If it's not measles, Measles. He's like, well, it's not measles. Move on. Well, hold on. I think that's kind of important to know if there's something that looks like measles, gets everyone all freaked out. That's, that's measles. I'm telling you, as you heard, uh, St. Clair County, that little girl, it was presumptive positive until the actual 
presumptive positive. Nice. Tests were done and examined, and that was by the CDC. So no measles in Alabama. But remember, we have those 80 investigations. And, of course, we can also tell you the health department, they look into communicable vaccinated cases, the possible diseases, all the time. So that is this is not hey, that unusual. I, an I, <laughs> I think that's what he's doing. He's auctioning off this idea that we all need to get a shot. Did catch up with Dr. Karen Landers today. She's with the public health department. Tell me, overall, Alabama is still in very good shape when it comes to measles. We're a highly vaccinated state. Still, you know, there is that possibility. Somebody unvaccinated gets exposed elsewhere. Come- you meant a vaccineer. Comes here, could cause a problem. If you have any questions, again, check with your doctor. He'll let you know if possible if you need to get a booster or not. I get your booster. I think we should get boosters. Let's get boosters for our anniversary, baby. <laughs> Let's get a booster together. And there's some Yahoo Jamoke in San Francisco who's been, uh, you know, if you want to get out of this, you know, you can buy your way into school. You can buy your way out of vaccines. We showed up at the offices of Dr. Kenneth Stoller on Broadway, whose medical records will be reviewed by the San Francisco City Attorney's Office. Yeah. Well, this is part of an ongoing investigation into whether or not uh, this particular doctor was granting medical exemptions uh, to patients that didn't qualify for them. There is no hiding the fact that Stoller has issued medical exemptions for vaccination purposes. We found people had written on Google Review about his work. I am so grateful to have... (laughs) This is now journalism. Well, we checked out the web and we got a Google Review page. (laughs) It's like Yelp, only shittier. Yeah, let's read that for everybody. We found people had written on Google Review about his work. I am so grateful to have found him to help my son regarding vaccinations. Another posted, we sought out Dr. Stoller when in the middle of spring of last year, my daughters were being asked for new vaccine exemptions. Senate Bill 277, which went into effect in 2016, says you can no longer cite religious or personal beliefs to get Get out of vaccinating children. I didn't know. But I didn't the know two that. state senators behind. California. Yeah, <laughs> you can only get out of it if um, if you have cancer or if you have an immune system issue. Which, quite honestly, you know, you got a lot of other problems going on. Of course, you want to introduce a, a virus, but you probably also shouldn't be in school with an immune issue. Out of vaccinating. You know, huh? Nothing. Keep playing that clip. Children, but the two state senators behind 277 allowed for medical exemptions, which include a person's family history. Dr. Stoller's attorney skyped with us from back east. So there are a group of doctors in California that have taken these two senators at their word and are issuing broader indications based on family history, just like these senators said they could do. But now State Senator Richard Pan, one of the authors of the bill, says the law has been exploited by some doctors. As you know, we're having measles showing up. People are bringing it into our state, and we can't have measles spreading rapidly through a school. He's now behind... How does that work if if 99% is, is vaccinated? How can it spread rapidly through the school? It makes no sense unless they were shooting people up with distilled water and charging Stuff them 10, that does, 20 bucks. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, you. it's Occam's razor, really. And we can't have measles spreading rapidly through a school. He's now behind another bill, 276, this time calling for the state health department to vet all medical exemptions. And both State Senator yeah. Pan and the city attorney's office say they are most concerned with kids who cannot get vaccinated because they either have cancer or a compromised immune system they say wow she said that almost with disdain these kids can't because they've got cancer but you can't get your shot because you got cancer what's wrong with you kid and the city attorney's office say they are most <laughs> concerned with kids who cannot get vaccinated because they either have cancer or a compromised immune system they yeah, these stupid ass kids say they're the ones in real danger oh yeah California is becoming Florida uh, with these crazy stories. I, mean, I got a California story. I, similar I, I, can I, I just wanted to say before you move on, just want to say something about this. This semi-vax uh, the talk that we have, because we're not anti-vaxxers. We're just, you know. Yeah, you keep bringing this up. Yes. It's important. You got to say it. I want to say it for people who are just new listening to us. You appreciate what you are a part, not you, John, but what everyone else is a part of with this program. 
You can't say this stuff and post it on YouTube. You can't say this stuff oh, no, and, and put it on Facebook. You can't say this stuff and, oh, they listen to my great show on SoundCloud. You can't, you know, we can't sell CDs of this on Etsy. Be- just because you're asking questions, you get kicked off of that, which is why we use the actual internet and all the pieces that it includes. Let me close out the segment. Measles. How vulnerable is the general public right now? Cases have been surging, and that is a 25-year high. Are you sure it's the measles? Yeah. All right. The measles. The measles. Well, in San Francisco, they have this story. This is teacher has to pay for her replacement story. <laughs> A California teacher who is battling breast cancer isn't just facing oh, mounting man. medical fees. She is also being forced to pay for her own replacement. Turns out it is the law. Here's Jamie Yukas. She's a veteran second grade teacher at San Francisco's Glen Park Elementary School. We're choosing not to identify her to protect her privacy. When parents heard she was actually required to pay for her own substitute, they were outraged and launched a GoFundMe page to help cover costs. They could not believe that this could this could be happening, that this would be a law. Um, the more I found out, the more angry I got. Teachers can use 10 paid sick days per school year. Once those are exhausted, they can use 100 days of extended sick leave and receive their regular salary minus the substitute's pay. It doesn't seem fair at all. Connie Leva chairs the California Senate's Education Committee. We would never want one of our teachers who is basically educating our future to be worried about where their family's going to be when they're out battling cancer. Since the GoFundMe page was launched at the end of last month, nearly $14,000 has been raised, well over the $10,000 goal. The teacher posted an appreciation. My heart is lifted and it gives me so much strength to know that so many people care about me and my family. I hope next year our leaders in Sacramento will take a hard look at that and make sure that they change the language and the law. Jamie Yukas, CBS News. Yeah, when are you guys uh, leaving the union? No, oh, can't can't come sh- quick enough. Can't come quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> now, I wow. have one clip I want to play, uh, which I think is, I don't know if we're going to get to it or not, but we are now. Because we talked about this in the last couple of shows. I think uh, we've discussed the false flag. Yes, we were quite familiar with the flag of falseness. And it's going to be in Iran. We need an Iranian false flag. That's why we got the fleet out there. uh, This is the latest uh, Uh, from uh, CBS. uh, And by the way, I want to, you know, Jeff Glor is is quitting or or got, no, got fired uh, from the CBS Evening News. He did have a very, I have a little short, his sign off is very sweet because it was mostly about the crew. He didn't talk too much about himself. And then he actually quit on Friday, quit the show early and talked about the crew. And he said, I want to thank every one of them. Then they did a, a slow roll of the credits yeah you know which is what you usually do if the yeah. show's not long enough yes but in this case it was like he walks off the thing you know and they do this unbelievably slow roll of just <laughs> not only everybody that's on this doing the interns, show interns interns because i know they don't have eight cameramen working the show well in not on that particular night but no but that's the point well anyway they, they did a slow roll but jeff glorious i do have his last sign off it's kind of sweet I, we don't need to play well, it, i but... want to hear it now no no you set it up okay we'll as we it. leave here tonight i just want to say thanks how long was he in this job a year I don't know, two year or two year years? And he took over from pelly i they, they, first it was anthony mason took over from pelly and then they kicked him the uh, to the field and and they brought glory in. as i thought well i thought you know, it was I the, the way mason he was there to was stay presenting. yeah and I like Gloria because he's got a very nice, he's got an extremely pleasant professional voice. He's not a flubber. And he and he seems objective, unlike Pelly, who is a Trump hater. Yeah. And so what are they going to do? They're going to get rid of Glore, and they're bringing in the Trump hater, Nora O'Donnell. Yes. <laughs> from the morning show. And she she's going to be, she's a flubber. She's not going to be able to sit there and, and seriously read the news. What are they thinking? By the way, according to the Mueller report, Ever since you got canned from uh, PC Magazine, you've become a Trump supporter. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see that in there, so that's bull crap. <laughs> well, someone said so on Twitter, so it must be true. So uh, let's <laughs> hear, uh, anyway, so Glor- I want to hear his goodbye. Let's hear Glor's goodbye. Oh, yeah. As we goodbye. leave here tonight, I just want to say thanks. This is a short broadcast, but a long game. Through it all, the people who put on the evening news remain committed. This program will be moving to Washington, D.C. in the coming months. I wish Nora O'Donnell the best of luck 
Well, she won't uh, need it because of all the people. <laughs> I heard it. I heard it. I wish her the best of luck. Wish Nora O'Donnell the best of luck. <laughs> but she won't need it because of all the people backing her up. Uh-huh. So I'd like to use the time I have left on this night to recognize them. Their hours are long and unpredictable. Their family and friends are unfailingly patient. No, oh, no. Oh, thanking the crew. Yeah. It's an old one. It's, it's, a, t- it's a team effort. I think well, I think know, my crew going on and on about these four, these guys screwed me over. <laughs> so let's what else so do? what we don't They're know what happened. Bringing hap- Nora O'Donnell to take my place? Are you kidding me? That's what he should have said. Yeah, I bet she tests really well though. Well, you wait until she starts doing it. No, I, I mean this is like I the time they brought. Well. Who is it they brought in? That woman? I think it was also brought into CBS that. Uh, the morning woman from the Today Show was, um, I can't remember her name, but I, she was terrible. Know. You know, just because, you, you know, it's nice to have a woman anchor, but it, you can't do it. I mean, the, the the epitome of female anchors on news reading is, is Asian. Amy Goodman. What happened to Connie? Connie Chung. Yeah, whatever happened to Connie Chung? I think she married Mo- Maury Povich. Did no, she, she did, did marry him, but... She was a pretty, she was, she great. was actually pretty good. Yeah, she, but she was, like, she was your stereotyp like- she was your stereotypical Asian woman uh news model. I will say this. They had and I don't want to sound like a racist. But the Asian news readers I've seen the ones that come because we have a lot of them in the Bay Area and they come and go. Yeah. There was one woman here that you you would just sit and waiting. I mean, I don't care who you are and how good you are. You can't go weeks after weeks after weeks of daily news reading with never, never making a flub, saying, uh, something. There was this woman, I can't remember her name, but she would s- scream through the news and she would be flawless. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, maybe the Asian, some Asian news readers are just, they just have a skill set that, you know, you can't otherwise achieve. And so Connie Chung, I think, was in that league. I, Nora O'Donnell will not pull this off. Oh. She won't pull it off. You watch. That wasn't racist at all, by the way. I don't yes. understand what you were worried about. I'm always worried because you keep calling me out on it. Well, you're misogynist as all hell. But okay. No, let's, uh, so the, anyway, so okay. to, back to Iran. So that, the reason why we think that it's ripe for a false flag is A, I mean, come on. It's what they do. It's fun. Um, uh, B... We had Pence specifically tell a group of Iranians behind closed doors, which was, oh, not Pence, uh, Pompeo, CIA, State State Department, former CIA. We'll get it. Eventually. Specifically told them, which means, you know, it had to leak out. We're just holding back. We're not doing anything. No aggressive moves from us. It's not going to be us. Whatever you move, see might happen. It won't be us. We're not doing anything. So that means, of course, that there's something afoot. And meanwhile, they take the Abraham Lincoln and about eight ten, destroyers. 10,000 10, sailors. Hello, yeah, sailor. And they, right, and they send them right. You know, oh, this is uh, this is, and nobody's saying this is. Uh, <laughs> yes, Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard's all over it. Haven't you heard? <laughs> I haven't heard that, but I, here's the report from CBS. With Iran's Jeff. Revolutionary Guard today ruled out any talks with the U.S. aimed at getting Tehran to give up its nuclear program. This as tensions grew with a new show of force in the region. Here's David Martin. A carrier strike group has already passed through the Suez Canal and B-52 bombers already landed at an air base in the Persian Gulf. But the Pentagon is sending even more forces to back up its warnings to Iran. Patriot air defense missiles, an amphibious assault ship, a nuclear-powered submarine, along with fresh supplies of precision-guided weapons are all on their way. In response to intelligence reports, Iran is preparing to attack American troops or diplomats. Secretary of State Pompeo has warned any attacks will be answered with a swift and decisive U.S. response. In an interview with Margaret Brennan for Face the Nation, former Defense Secretary Robert Gates said he's worried the stage is being set for a conflict neither side wants. 
And if the Iranians make the mistake of launching an attack in the Persian Gulf on an American warship, the administration probably won't have any alternative but to retaliate. Jeez. The carrier Lincoln was first passed by Yemen, where Iranian-backed rebels have in the past fired missiles at American <laughs> ships. And once it arrives at the entrance to the Persian Gulf, it will be operating under the noses of Iran's hardline Revolutionary Guard units. David Martin, CBS News, the Pentagon. You know, I I really hope uh, Trump has a, a handle on what's going on here. Because it, all these things can just collapse so poorly. And, and really, I mean, Dan, they're, they're ratcheting up the Syrian thing again. Oh, Assad is bombing. I didn't even clip it. It was so insulting. Assad is bombing hospitals again. Killing children and patients. Hospitals. The yeah, war that, machine that is good. huge. Well, this particular situation is so obvious. We're shipping all these armaments. Yeah, 10,000. 10,000 uh, on sailors alone. Yeah, and what is? And here's the one thing that is never discussed by any of these news operations. Because you could, if you were walk, working in D.C., you could ask somebody. You can go, you have the Pentagon briefings. Uh, the question is, what does it cost to, sh- to move the... The Abraham Lincoln and all the new gear and fly the B-52s and take all those ships and move them into the into the region uh, right next to Iran. What does it cost? Well, how much does it cost to move all this gear over there in the first place? It's got to cost. I, it's got to cost. I'm pretty a sure. Fortune. No, I'm pretty sure we can find the answer in the Mueller report. <laughs> Space Force. Yeah, that's what it is. Everyone's you're the me, The so-called media is so bad. I mean, it's hard enough. Even if you put something in a headline in the New York Times, most people won't really know about it. It's got to be headline news for days and days and days. It's got to be hammered. There's too much media, too much noise. People tune it out. They got the other things to do. They don't care. So the machine is very good at the repetition because that's what works. It's how. Why do you see the same damn princess toast commercial for the? Stupid vitamin C gummy bear for your moronic kids. And I and I don't have kids and I keep seeing this ad. Well, I have one, but not who needs the gummy bears. It's because it works and you remember it. But they're not all they're doing is mullah 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 bar trump mullah 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 bar trump mullah 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 bar trump. Nothing <laughs> not informing the American people. And I'm sure it's not much better anywhere else. No, it's well, you know it's not. Let's go. Here's a, here's an interesting one. This is a story. Yeah, sorry. Yes. This is the story uh, that um, we should take our break. We can't unless it's related. Oh. We should we should do a break here. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm going to show my support by donating to No Agenda. Imagine all the people who could do that. <laughs> oh yeah, that'd be fab. Yeah, on No Agenda. All right, we do have a few people to thank for show 1137, starting with author Arthur Gobitz. Gobitz or Gobitz. Sir, Sir Arthur Hugger Gobitz. Kittens. And he actually sent a note in in Dutch. I just wanted to say, I'll translate on the fly. Adam, this is my Mother's Day donations for my mom, who's had a hard time recently with my dad, who has a broken hip. Uh, his, with his, his brother or son has ADHD. No. No, he says it's really tough to have a son who has ADHD who just became a Viscount. Oh, I guess he's talking about himself. <laughs> he needs health and relationship karma for uh, uh, for dad, but especially for mom, Margriet, a Mother's Day call out. So I wanted to make sure he did that. And since he is, of course, Sir Arthur Gobetz, I will hand out a karma as well. You've got karma. I know I'm going off book, but it's Sir Arthur. Sir Hugger now of Kitties. The uh, I, wait, while I read the names and donations, mm-hmm. you will be looking for the Mother's Day callouts because it was an open yes uh, style, which means you can donate any amount, and then we'll call out your mom if you so mention it. Yes. In other words, you mention your mom, we'll we'll call her out. Okay. That's the way this worked. It okay. wasn't a big success, but it was something. We- <laughs> but we we do it every year in hopes that it'll work, and yet again, no. <laughs> It's just work. Valentine's Day is worse, which which makes me really wonder. Oh, that's the, people are fighters, not lovers here, man. 
David Rosenfeld, one hundred twenty-five dollars. Nothing he's about his no, mom. He's, he, no, he's, he's he's a good guy, but it's nothing about his mom. Jeffrey Jacques, Jacques, Jeffrey Jacques. Yeah, Happy Mother's Day to my mom, Jackie, and my wife, Marty, and to all No Agenda followers, mothers, wives, and sisters. Doctor Jeff gave in Manhattan, one twenty-three forty-five. Hocus Locus, one eighteen forty-three. His message huh. was, please disregard this message. <laughs> Fantastic. Stephen Draper in Arlington, Virginia, $111.10. No note at all. Brian in Portland, Oregon. Uh, nope. Sir Tristan Banning in Toronto, uh, which is uh, 139 Canadian, he likes to say. Chad Finkbeiner, $100, and his first donation, give him a de-douching. Okay, do. You've been de-douched. Uh, Lynn Fogwell, $100. Rob Van Dyke, $100 from the, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, Sir Patrick Coble, of course, Earl of Tennessee, ninety nine ninety nine. Happy Mother's, Happy Mother's Day. Day to my best friend, my wife, and mother of our two kids. You are awesome. And we appreciate everything you do to for our family. I'm also blessed to have my mom and her mom in our lives. A lot of moms oh, in that nice. group. Probably why he's traveling so much. Um, Sir Crow, the Fiber Knight, 8008. Happy first Mother's Day to my smoking hot wife, Kim. Boob for breast milk. What? 8008. Ask for, wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> Ask for human resource and job karma back in November. Got dividends on both. Should have also asked for birthing karma. Okay, turn 30 on May 11th. Yes, Sir Crow, the Fiber Knight, you're on the list for today. Alexander Salzberger, 8008. Sir D.H. Slammer, uh, 6969. He's got some some requests for some stuff we'll put at the end, uh, hopefully. Matthew Mongan, 69. Sir Dwight the Knight, 6789. Baron Mark Tanner. Six seven eight nine. What's his specialty? As a matter of fact, six seven eight nine. Uh, Jonathan Greenley, fifty eight fifty eight. My hold Miguel on, hold on, Pat- hold on, hold on, hold on. Jonathan Greenley, Happy Mother's Day to Mother Milne of the Rock River Valley. Your loving son, JG, and the kids. And uh, Miguel Lopez, fifty six seventy eight. Happy Mother's Day to Mom Mercedes and his smoking hot wife Tanya. Adam Conklin, fifty five fifty five. David Good, fifty five twelve. Sending you some cash to give my lovely, uh, lovely maybe wife and no, my lovely and loving mother Nelda a podcast shout out. Don't worry, she'll never hear it. What's a podcast and such? Thanks. <laughs> Robert Smiley, fifty five ten. For his mom Betty, even though she's dementia B, I still love her. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Nick, Nicholas Zumas, call uh, up, 510. Uh, he says, uh, for Mother's Day, call up my wife Katie as a douchebag for not being subscribed to the newsletter. No, we're not going to do that. We don't douche women for that. Ryan, well, you're getting it, aren't you, Nicholas? No. Uh, it's enough. Just make her read it. Ryan, forward it to her. Just make <laughs> her life miserable. Uh, uh, Ray, Ryan Brady, 5510. Yeah, happy Mother's Day, Mom, if you still listen. <laughs> We're doing well with moms, aren't we? Yeah, this is part of the problem. <laughs> All love, 5510. Yeah, yay, Mom, Sir Daddy Cast of the Love House. Cynthia Burt, 55. Yeah, that's to her, Mom. I love you, Mom, Cindy, she says. Okay. Wow. Now we got, now we got somebody who decided to write War and Peace, which of course in my spreadsheet I can't see. Yeah, we or, should we should come up with it just as a suggestion because I've done this myself. It's Christopher King. The joke is you, know, you wrote War and Peace. What would be a hipper version of that? Should it be like the uh Kicked Over the Hornet's Nest trilogy or maybe Tolkien or Lord of the Rings? We need to update what when we say that. Well, you, we don't say it. Ah, oh, it's my joke. I say it all the time, and you want me to change it. No, I'm, I, I, I say it too. It's, um, yeah, you know I've what? Never, change it. Work on that. Just work on your material. Atlas Shrugged. The Bible? The Bible? <laughs> Atlas Shrugged. I don't know. What come Atlas up. Shrugged. <laughs> Atlas Shrugged. Hey, this is my ben first Rand. donation, he says, and special shout out to both, both mothers and the M. Efforts that made them that way. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, no names. We're seeing 55 bucks. We're not reading this entire note. There's no way. No. Um, Sir, it just goes on too long. Yes. Sir Mike from Ewing, New Jersey. Happy Mother's Day. Happy birthday to my smoking hot wife, Chris. Yes, she is on the list. Uh, he's also, he gave 5467. Laura Wilson, 55, 50, 53, 50 feet, three, if I can say it, uh-huh. in Sammamish, Washington. And he has, and she says, happy 53rd to Sir Austin of the Snowy Cascades. May 12th is his birthday, same day as our daughter graduates college. Very nice. She says, Robert, Rob, Robert Roberts, 5150. In honor of his awesome mom, Stephanie Gunter, a cowhand in California and tougher than any man I know, he says. Seriously, and the random number theory continues. We have Austin Wilson. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, <laughs> obviously, the relation to uh, Laura Wilson in Sammamish, Washington, 5120. Yes. Happy Mother's Day to Dame Laura of the Snowy Cascades from Sir Austin of the Snowy Cascades. It's quite the day as our daughter graduates from. So these two, they are so loving this family. And they, they're both like they're surprising each other and both mention their daughter. Beautiful, beautiful family. Uh, Stuart Walton, 51. Uh, today, what is the day today? They're graduating from college in the middle of May? Yeah, uh, at least just graduated. She just came home Friday. Oh, they're just trying to cut the year down, these <clears> guys. Love to, <laughs> love to mom Jill in Stansted, Montfichet. It's in the UK from her son, Stuart and Simon. 85, still going strong. Never had a fight. Reads the newspaper without their glasses. And that's Stuart Walton, uh, $51. Uh, Brielle Slate in Lake Hopakong in New Jersey. <clears throat> Happy birthday to Jeremy Ryan Slate of the Create Your Own Life podcast. Love Brielle and Adelaide. Yes, on the list. Got it. <clears throat> 5088 from uh, Brielle. Lee Olivares, Olivares, 5058 for our mom, our mom Diane. Baronet Sir Economic Hitman came in from Houston, Texas, $50.01. The following people. Will be fifty dollars. Uh, name and location, if I can have the location, and Adam will catch the mom's uh, shout outs. That's what I do, starting with Robert Kerback in Essexville, Michigan, Kevin Silverman in Severn, Maryland, Robert Dakeney, 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 in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, Sam Godwin in uh, Parts Unknown. For my mom, Sue, who gave me courage and was never afraid to hit me in the mouth. Roy Denhaven in Pine Knocker. Very good. Uh, Holland. Get Mo Lowlands. Black Knight. Black Knight. It says Black Knight. Black Knight, Sir Lineman of the Net Raleigh Hawk. Yes. Happy Mother's Day to my wife, Robin, from Black Knight, Sir Lineman of the Net Raleigh Hawk. Indeed. Pronounced Marcello? Is that her name? I guess. Marcello. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's the next one. That's no, Marcello. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Marcello. Um, again, uh, Musumeci, I guess. Mm-hmm. 50. That's a, that's, is there a... No, but it's, it is his first donation. He says, credit unfilter for bringing me here. Are those guys still on? I thought they were off the air. No, no, they're, they're, no. Okay. He, they, they haven't been on for almost a year now. He uh, probably listened to Unfilter, picked up our show, uh, and then yeah, and wanted he wanted the original waited to donate. <laughs> wanted the originals thing. <laughs> He's hoping to God they come back, but no, they didn't. Right. Uh, of course, they could have asked us for help, and we could have shown them some ways of making money. Not anymore. Jonathan Ferris in Liberal Kansas, uh, Kimberly Redman in Toronto, Ontario, and our last on our list uh, is Robert Bruckner and. He doesn't have any. So that's it for our call-outs, too. Okay. Well. I want to thank these folks. I want to thank their moms. Yes. Uh, and and happy Mother's Day. Can... Happy, happy Mother Day, Mother's Day to Tiffany, my sister, and my sister Willow, both outstanding moms, of course. Tina the Keeper. And happy Mother's Day to Mimi. Tina the Keeper is the Jessie. best mom in the universe. Jesse, who will never listen to the show. No, it's not, uh, not such a great mom because she doesn't listen. So. Well, yeah, she'd be a better <laughs> mom if she listened to the show. <laughs> And also, I guess uh, uh, D up in uh, uh, Eric DeShill's wife. She does listen. Yeah, she sometimes. listens from time to time, and she's busy. She, and she, she got, how many is, got twenty uh, twenty boys? They got there. How many kids are running around hey, there? She got. They got thirteen kids. Yeah, I knew it was something like that. Yeah, it's and nuts. Um, 
<laughs> she will be, uh, she may or may not hear the call out. Well, uh, thank you all very and much. And all the other moms that we missed, we miss yes, saying hello. We, we love all our moms. And our moms in heaven, John. Yeah. <laughs> My, my deaf mom in heaven. What? What? What was they talking Did you about say me? What? Uh, we do have a make good uh, from Joe Salas Hour. Hey, Adam John, I heard episode 1135 where I donated $121. Donation was attributed to me. The donation was supposed to be for my buddy and fellow producer Clay uh, Basavice. I think, in order to get him to knighthood. I just wanted to send you both an email so we could get the credit for the donation and finally reach knighthood. So uh, we need to have the details about his knighthood. So have Clay uh, send in a note to either myself or John, and uh, we'll get it off to the back office, and Eric she will take care of it. But that will be next time. We still have a couple of things on the list before we uh, get back to the show. Meetups. The list keeps growing. Uh, I'll give it to you one more time. You can find these at noagendameetups.com. People are organizing these so you can meet up with other like-minded folk. It's nice, no matter where you are in the world. And, you know, it's, it's like a, it's, there's no condemnation at a No Agenda Meetup. It doesn't matter who you are or what you are. Yeah, everybody has, uh, they're all free thinkers. Yes. It's, it's really nice. It's very, very enjoyable. May yes. 18th, Cincinnati, Ohio. The 25th, we've got two. Eastern North Carolina, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, oh, I uh, I forgot. The, the 20th, this is not official yet, but I think Sir Jono is trying to set up a, a meetup in Tel Aviv, in oh, Israel, huh. on the 20th. But but uh, Mimi thinks really? that his yeah, posting is spam or something, so i got to talk to Mimi make sure she knows that, yeah, we have people in Israel. So that would be a nice meetup to go to, May 20th. So we're working on that. But again, you can find this at noagendameetups.com when they're confirmed. Charleston, South Carolina on the 30th of May into June, Sarasota, Florida on the 2nd. Seattle, Washington, June 6th. Toronto, uh, Canada on June 7th. Oklahoma City on the 8th of June. And Copenhagen, uh, June 15th. So that's what's on the books. Yeah, I mean, this is fantastic. And once... Yeah, you know, we've gotten a lot of busy period behind us. I look forward to hopefully coming to a couple of these. And also thank you to everybody who came in under $50, which we always keep as a cutoff mark for people who definitely want to be anonymous, no mess ups possible. All of you and also those of you on uh, uh, rotating, continuing subscription donations. Thank you for keeping this program going. It is, after all, your podcast. And coincidentally, the best one in the universe. Dvorak.org. Slash N A. Let's just do the obligatory karma. Jobs, 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 and jobs. Let's vote for jobs. You've got karma. Here we go. It is, uh, well, yeah, Mother's Day, the 12th of May, 2019. Here's our birthday list for Kevin Dills, Viscount of Charlotte, uh, turns 33 today. Mr. Mike, uh, Sir Mike, says happy birthday to his smoking hot wife, Chris. She celebrated on the 13th, so a little belated. Laura Wilson, happy birthday to Sir Austin of the Snowy Cascades for his birthday today. Brielle and Adelaide, so happy birthday to Jeremy Ryan Slate. And Sir Crow, the Fiber Knight, we congratulate him uh, belatedly. He turned 30 on May 11th. Happy birthday to all of you from all of us here at the best podcast in the universe. Let's get straight to it with uh, our daming. I'd like to get uh, Mrs. Owens up here. Blade, thank you very much. Mrs. Owens, step on up and congratulations and insta daming. I haven't seen one of those in a long time, but we're very pleased to have you here. This is the round table over there. You see the knights and the dames. We interspersed. You can sit wherever you want. So you can choose your spot. But of course, this is thanks to your husband's insta daming in the amount of one thousand dollars. And I'm hereby very proud to pronounce the Kate the Dame Shay Shay, Dame of the No Agenda Roundtable. For you, by request, we have uh, uh, coffee and Kringle. Yes, we got hookers and and uh, blow. We got rent boys and Chardonnay. You might be into that. Of course, we also have uh, mutton and mead. <laughs> Go over to noagendanation.com slash rings. Eric, the show will help you out and get that out to you as soon as possible. And please tweet out a picture 
We love our dames, our knights, all royalty of the No Agenda Roundtable. Thank you. Dvorak.org slash NA. All help is welcome and necessary. So, uh, so I have a note, I have a note yes. from producer Grant mm-hmm. about this, the mention of the, of the diesel subs. Which was, oh, we were talking about them. If it was an antiquated thing, or why we were laughing what was about the point it, they made. The, yes. What was the point of saying it? Well, this guy, he, this a couple guy, of people actually said writes, this. In. Yeah, diesel subs are exceedingly quiet compared to nuclear boats. Uh, nuclear vessels need to maintain their coolant pumps even when l- lying silent. This means they always create some level of noise that can be detected by passively listening. Diesel subs run on batteries, meaning that they can be completely silent while moving at low speed and cannot be detected unless they move uh, quickly, which causes cavitation. Ah. This means the sub can move into a shooting position without the enemy detecting them. While running like this, uh, their opponent must use active sonar to ping them. Active sonar gives away the the picket ship's exact position and is likely to invoke a torpedo launch at the surface ship doing the pinging. This is why they are very dangerous. Okay. The diesel sub's weakness is that they need to charge their batteries using their loud diesel engines, either while on the surface or just beneath it while using a snorkel. Mm-hmm. They are very right. vulnerable right. while doing this. Yeah. There you go. There's a little background yes. there for people who don't know. The more you know. On the No Agenda Show. Alyssa Milano, uh, she's pretty powerful in Hollywood due to her, I think her husband, who is a big CAA agent, I think. Um, she is uh, using a, an oldie, but goodie, the old Lysistrata trick, calling for a sex strike to protest anti-abortion laws. Uh, in other words, uh, let me see. I think she has a lo- slogan or a logo. It's a big pink sign with a big X. And where is it? Oh, here it is. Hashtag sex strike. Our reproductive rights are being erased until women have legal control over our own bodies. We just cannot risk pregnancy. Join me by not having sex until we get bodily autonomy back. That's a bumper sticker. Huh. This is horrible. This well, the, is, the, the real executed. action right now is in the South. Uh, Georgia, of course, passed this, laws, yes, the laws. Yes, the heartbeat uh, bill. The heart, the, which is dubious. It's questionable. It's, it's completely bullcrap. dubious. It's completely, I think it's, it's yes, it's very lame. So, and so the, all the Hollywood, a lot of Hollywood movies are made in Georgia. Ah, they have over right. 1 million exactly. square feet of uh, soundstage in Georgia. Yes, Perfect. It's huge. They have a lot of sound stages, and they got a lot of action. They get, they get, and the workers are cheaper. Yeah, you know. So yeah. So they like to make movies there. But now I, I think Spielberg and some other guys that are that are kind of signed up to do movies there said, well, they're going to take their profits from these movies and give them to some <laughs> rights organizations. They're not actually pulling out completely, as some others claim. But the the super action is in Alabama, mm-hmm. where they're just going to make. Abortion is illegal, and it's supposed to be the lead into the eventual, supposedly. I don't know what's really going on there, but I have a clip. Oh, you have a clip. Good, 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 good. Okay. Because I have some questions about this. Let's listen to the clip first. Alabama State Senate delayed a vote Thursday on a law that would ban virtually all abortions after a rancorous floor debate that saw lawmakers repeatedly shout in protest. The bill would make providing an abortion a Class A felony punishable by up to 99 years in prison. The Alabama Senate Minority Leader Bobby Singleton objected after Republican leaders sought to remove amendments from the abortion ban that would have allowed exemptions in cases of rape or incest. He didn't, he didn't even make a motion, Mr. President. Hold on, he did not make a motion. He made a motion to table. He did not make a motion. There was no motion for another side. He, he made a motion to table. Singleton and other Democrats also protested when Republican leaders attempted to pass amendments on a voice vote. They demanded a roll call so that lawmakers' votes would be put on the record. This is Andrea Miller, president of the National Institute of Reproductive Health. 
I mean, the reality is what happened in the Alabama Senate just shows how high the stakes are right now when a state is planning to ban all abortions outright and not only eliminate access to abortion care for the people in their state, but in an effort to eliminate it for everyone all across the country, because they hope they'll be the ones to bring the case to the Supreme Court that will overturn or severely eviscerate Roe versus Wade. Yeah, I think they're a long way from doing that with these. Uh, although it, it's law, it's law. This heartbeat bill, which I read through because I'm very interested in the topic, and you know, it it completely flies in the f- in the face of the privacy of uh, Roe versus Wade. So I don't think that in actuality it will do much. But yeah, you know, what uh, eventually happens is the access. You have to go out of state, and that's definitely a problem. Look, I know about you, John. I'm pro killing people. Uh, I think it just to be televised. That's that's the only beef I have about it. I think you know, you put people on death row, we kill them. Hey, great! You got to televise it. This should be the same. But I'm confused about the numbers. We have uh, birth control, and so and it, it's very effective. hundred, it's ninety nine point nine percent effective. Multiple different kinds of ways. It's and it mainly ninety nine percent for uh, women uh, deal with the problem after all it's their body um i don't understand this these high numbers about five because i looked it up i was over the weekend about five percent uh, of all women per year i have an unwanted pregnancy 40 percent of those are african-american uh, who represent six percent of the population so that's very high my question is why uh, and it's not really answered. Uh, you know, there's some NIH studies. But you know, why do people become pregnant uh, when they don't want to? And I don't even know how to formulate the question. It's an un- I think they call it unintended pregnancy. As in unintended, didn't want to get pregnant, didn't want to have the baby. So are, is, is access to contraception too controversial, not available, too expensive? Why, why, is, why is this option being chosen with you know, a reasonably high frequency. I don't know. The only you answer I, me? well, the only answer I get from the NIH is education. It, it, the the, the uh, less educated you are uh, and the less, and the poorer you are, the more chance that you're going to uh, have an unintended pregnancy. I still just yeah. don't, I mean, so that means that again, education just needs to be, be better or, are there other reasons? I'm just looking for a, it's high. I find this number high, and we have so many different ways n- to stop unwanted pregnancy up front. No one, no one has this talk. You know, it's all about the the baby killing part and the choice or life or whatever. But what is the root cause? Now, you don't know either, I guess. I don't have a clue. Yeah, but isn't I mean, it? Except for the simple education, where people don't care or they're careless. There's a lot of carelessness. Or there's just the pad, the heat of the moment, and who knows? I mean, it's just, I don't know. I'm, I'm out of the group that's involved with this. I mean, the only thing that I can think about after, and I really, I put it's in the show notes, I put some study into it of unintended pregnancies, and, and they have, it's one a very, it's surveyed a lot, but the answer is all they say is, well, here are the groups who have it more often. But is it possible that we're so shattered, certainly the African-American um, Amer- African Americans, um, who historically, really ever since the welfare state came into being, the real welfare, um, are fatherless families. I, I have this fear that there are a lot of uh, black women who feel like, okay, I'm going to have a child with this guy, my baby daddy. You know, you hear them all talk, my baby daddy. It's this whole cultural thing. And it's not just black, but this is where we're hearing it the baby daddy and maybe he'll stay with me and it's almost used like a like a like a uh, like a bond between you know, a wishful bond and then it doesn't happen the baby daddy leaves like oh now i want to get rid of the kid that's it feels like that may be some of it and it can be black or white but it just the numbers say african-american women 40 percent of all abortions and this and now we're just looking at the unintended ones unintended pregnancies i don't know it's i'd I, this is the stuff I'd like to understand. Maybe I'm sure we have people in uh, producers who can. It's not going to be discussed. Out. Well, no, but we can discuss it if our producers uh, point us <laughs> well, in the right we could, direction. We could read some producers' notes, but we have no nothing real information. Absolutely nothing. But uh, yeah, 
Other other than everyone just going ape shit over this. Is there nothing about it in the Mueller report? No, I didn't see anything about it in the Mueller report. So, um <laughs> Another, I got another news story that we didn't get any. We have no information. But this hasn't been covered by anybody. Who's our new defense secretary? Do you know what's his name? Yeah, isn't it the the junior guy who came in the the the, the under secretary guy? I think it might be. Uh, what's the clip? Be nice to know. You know, this is probably an important job. <laughs> what's the clip? Oh, yeah. New New defense defense secretary. Secretary. President Trump's nominated Patrick Shanahan to become the next secretary of defense. Shanahan Shanahan has been acting Pentagon chief since Trump fired James Mattis at the start of the year. Last month, an internal Pentagon ethics investigation cleared Shanahan following accusations. He unfairly favored the weapons contractor Boeing, where he spent over three decades as an executive. (laughs) Yes. I I think we talked about we talked about him because he was the Boeing guy. Not the, yeah, going. we discussed this. I have I have two clips, two media related clips. Um, okay. The first one is it's only the intro to an interview with Matt Taibbi. Matt Taibbi, I like a lot as a journalist. He writes for Rolling Stone or wrote for Rolling Stone, and then um, I think he moved to the Intercept, and he's and yeah. he's still well, no, there. And then he he left the Intercept. And he left the Intercept. Yeah, that's right. He went back anyway. Yeah, because he found it to be. I actually had a phone conversation with him, and I he I asked him about the intercept thing, and he just thought it was just uh, disorganized. Well, maybe it was at the time. It seems to be a lot better now. Yeah, you don't know. Um, no, you don't. Anyway, he has a book called. But have you seen Taibi recently? He doesn't shave the head with. Unfortunately, it's not shaved. <laughs> yeah, it's like he's it's, looking a little scraggly. He's scraggly. Yeah, yeah that's a good word. So there's a book out that. called Hate Inc. And I have not read it yet. But he went on. So the only place he can um, can get on that is news related uh, is on Russia Today. He can't. Yeah, with Chris Hedges. He can't get on anything else. And I just wanted to play only the intro that Chris Hedges did before the interview because it kind of neatly sums up what's in the book. And I think it's going to be an interesting read. Welcome back to part two of our discussion of the decay that has beset American journalism with Matt Taibbi, the author of Hate incorporated how and why the media makes us hate one another. Last week we discussed the shattering of the old forms of media manipulation and the rise of a new media landscape built around demographic silos that sell internecine conflict. The result, Taibbi points out, is a bifurcated public that is addicted to hating each other. This new media landscape still manufactures consent, but by setting group against group, a consumer version of what George Orwell in 1984 called the two minutes of hate. Our opinions and prejudices are skillfully catered to and reinforced, aided by a detailed digital analysis of our proclivities and habits and sold back to us. It is, Taibbi writes, packaged anger just for you. The result is political impotence, a fractured and disempowered public crippled by hate and fear and mesmerized by the fake dissent of the culture wars and conspiracy theories rather than genuine dissent. The moral swamp is fertile soil for demagogues such as Donald Trump, who is a creation of this media burlesque and feeds our emerging corporate totalitarianism. And that's why you should not only listen to, but also support the No Agenda show. Because that's exactly what's out there. You don't even yeah. have to listen to the interview. And, and that, that piece itself was, was very slanted. Yeah, of course it was. That's yeah, what makes Chris it great. Chris is a known a socialist. Uh, congratul- he, he should be at Starbucks tweeting from his MacBook. So we have the trade war going on. Uh, another, uh, another interesting little uh, tidbit was on Democracy Now!, which I never heard anyplace else. Which is the Fran- The French are having, you know, besides having their yellow vest, which are protests, still ongoing, eh? six months now, tw- twenty six weeks. This is the the twenty six weekend. It's still going. Now they got a Yemen protest going on in France. In northern France, human rights activists are attempting to block authorities from loading French weapons onto a Saudi vessel, saying the shipment would be used to kill civilians in Yemen in violation of an international arms treaty. What? I thought we were the a-holes in that deal. Treaty. About 100 protesters turned out Thursday at the port of La Havre ahead of the arrival of the Saudi ship as lawyers for two separate human rights groups sued to prevent the shipment. The protest came after a French 
French news site reported French-made tanks and laser-guided missile systems were being used by the Saudi-led coalition against civilians in Yemen's war. This is Jean-Paul Lecoq, a member of the French National Assembly who joined Thursday's protest. Jean-Paul Lecoq. The war in Yemen is a difficult war. We are turned into supporters of Saudi Arabia, and if we, the French citizens, do not act, if we don't try to stop arms sales, we will end up as accessories to this business. We don't want this. We don't want to be in this situation. I wonder, this is, the French, you know, I, I give them a lot of props. So how, how was that intertwined? Well, actually, let me play my, uh, my Yellow Vest uh, clip, because this is what uh, I heard was going on, but maybe the two are intertwined or... Half of the people went over to the uh, Yemen protest. Heavy rain kept the number of yellow vest demonstrators down in Paris as the movement marked the 26th consecutive weekend of protests. Organizers were hoping to regain the momentum following a record low turnout last weekend. The government says fewer than 19,000 people turned out nationwide, although organizers said this was because of major May Day demonstrations earlier in the week. A bid to widen this weekend's protests. Big demonstrations were planned in the regional cities of Lyon, Nantes and Toulouse. More than 5,000 people were expected at the Lyon rally, called to protest against plans to privatize public services. Saturday's rallies come two weeks before European Parliament elections, when more protests are planned. The movement began last November as a protest over planned rises in fuel tax. It grew into a wider campaign of grievances against government policies. Yeah, mind you, your news is not to be trusted. You know, notice they don't mention what the tax was about. Oh, just a fuel tax. No, it was the climate change fuel tax. Yes. And so that that no longer is mentioned. Nobody wants to talk about it. No. I have a, a climate change thing, but I'm going to move that over to Thursday. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, it's an interesting theory that I was listening to, and I think it might fit a little bit. It help us understand more what's going on and what can be done and what can't be done. Uh, Greta Thunberg now tweeting that we really have to start. We only really have five years. Oh, we're going to be dead in five years because of climate change? (laughs) No, she says if we don't have substantial things underway in five years, then forget your 10-year mark. It's not going to happen. She got a PhD in this. What is the deal? She's got braids, man. Uh, Drug prices rigged. I have this clip. Okay. This is... Lawyers are crooked. The attorneys general of 43 states filed a lawsuit today accusing 19 generic drug companies and more than a dozen executives of price fixing. Generic drugs should cost much less than the brand name drugs they copy, but that is not always the case. Here's Bill Whitaker of 60 Minutes. It's an industry-wide conspiracy, Hmm. and I think it answers one of the biggest questions all of us are asking, which is why are prescription drugs so expensive? And I think we know why now, because the prices of generic drugs are fixed and there's a widespread conspiracy to rig the market. Connecticut Attorney General William Tong says his office found evidence of price fixing by dozens of generic drug industry sales directors, marketers, CEOs, dating back to 2006. How many drugs are we talking about? Hundreds. Hundreds of drugs. What kinds of drugs? Every kind of drug that touches our everyday lives. I'll give you an example. Bill, this is my bottle of doxycycline. It is a common antibiotic that I take every day for a skin condition. And there's a conspiracy around doxycycline. And so sitting here today as the Attorney General of the State of Connecticut, I'm one of the victims. And doxycycline makes kids nuts, doesn't it? No. No, it's just tetracycline. <laughs> Oh, uh, newer, oh, newer version. It's just a, <laughs> antibiotics. Okay. All right. Now, it's now make kids nuts. <laughs> give us something happy to leave the show on. Happy. I, I want. I, <laughs> well, Chelsea Manning's out. I think the Manning update. Nobody talks about her being out of jail. Wait a minute. She, I saw her on. Uh, I think she was on CNN uh, this morning. Was she? Yeah. It was it? It was an exclusive, uh, exclusive interview. It wasn't that exclusive? But okay. In Northern Virginia. Famed U.S. Army whistleblower Chelsea Eight. Manning was released mm-hmm. from a federal prison Thursday after spending 62 days behind bars for refusing to testify to a grand jury. Manning had been subpoenaed to answer questions about her leak of hundreds of thousands of secret State Department and Pentagon documents to WikiLeaks, including evidence of U.S. war crimes. The grand 
grand jury ultimately disbanded. Manning's freedom could be short-lived. Her lawyer said in a statement she will again refuse to testify in response to a separate subpoena. Yeah, I'll get the uh, I'll get the CNN interview for Thursday if there's anything in there. Maybe she'll show up on a couple other shows. Yeah. Huh. All right, awesome. everybody. We tried to break it down for you. The the deconstruction should be complete, at least for what we could bring you today. And we return on Thursday, where it's just plain old episode 1138. I don't think we have a Mother's Day or any other specialties. Although it will be the last one before, oh, I, yes. before I get hitched. So we will need to talk about what we're going to do for that show day. But that will happen on Thursday. Remember us at Dvorak.org slash NA. End of show. Credits go to Tom Starkweather and Jesse Coy Nelson. Two great mixes. And I'm coming to you from the frontier in Austin, Texas. Capital of the Drone Star State. FEMA region number six on all your governmental maps. In the morning, everybody, I'm Adam Curry. And from northern Silicon Valley, I'm John C. Dvorak. We return on Thursday right here with no agenda. Remember to support us at Dvorak.org slash NA. Until then, adios, mofos, and such. I'm a spy. Bye, slut. Shake it, not stirred. Have you ever heard this one? It was a spy slut that got him involved in being an economic hitman. Spy slut. Well, her name is Azra Turk, which of course is her nom de guerre. She was Massa Harry, the dancer, the spy, one of the great names of World War I espionage. Spy slut. Now, we've heard of honeypots, but spy slut, this is a good one, and that's in the I business. Like it. better. Spy slut. Vodka martini, shaken, not stirred. Hey, you got that spy slut from Turkey on deck yet? Hey. I'm a spy. Only in the panic. Come on, man. Power boy! Power boy! Yeah! <laughs> oh. Nothing wrong with that. Africa is not an asshole country. They're not bad folks, folks. China, if you're listening. Because the stunt in the circus continues over here. Because, uh, why why they do that? Uh, that the committee will find no conclusion, uh, no collusion, because that will be consistent. That is not conspiracy, because it's done right out in the open. <laughs> no, uh, I think this is going to have a happy ending. Dvorak.org slash N-A.